Live from the John Bassett Theatre from the Canadian International Auto Show in Toronto, this is the 2022 Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame induction ceremony presented by Klubine Motorsports and OTSFF Group. Ladies and gentlemen, your host for this evening, Todd Lewis. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate you being here. Thank you for joining us this evening. We are honoured to be back again for this year's event. I have seen a lot of familiar faces wandering around prior to coming in. It's wonderful. It was just about nine months ago we held the last ceremony for two years worth of inductees. If you liked last year, you will love this year. We only have 13 inductees tonight. This is going to be a breeze. As we begin, let me, re let me report on the State of the Union. I'm pleased to report that Canadian motorsports in many areas is experiencing growth and success. We know about our great national events in Canada, but lots of local and regional racing groups are also performing well. We've seen car counts coming up, more fans in attendance across the prairies, Ontario, Quebec and the East Coast, the SPC series, Pinty series, FEL sports cars and radicals, Cars, Canadian superbikes, karting groups and others are all welcoming new competitors and new fans and that is good news for all of us. <clears throat> Let me also say that it is wonderful to have the Canadian International Auto Show back again this year. I have been to the show a number of times over the last week. Crowds have been record-breaking and we are very happy for those involved, especially the general manager of the show, Jason Campbell, who we want to thank very much for his support of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame. We're pleased to be back here again in the John Bassett Theatre for our ceremonies. Jason, thank you for all you do for Canadian Motorsports in the Hall of Fame. Would you please come up and say a few words? Thank you, Todd. Thank you, Peter. And thank you all for joining us here tonight. It's really great to be back and celebrating motorsport and the community. And uh, of course, being back live again after three long years away. That's been, a, that's been a big, long wait for us. And we're so happy to see the public coming back and all of you tonight. That's been wonderful. We actually had a chance to get together about uh, just over a week ago for the induction with the Hall of Fame during our collector celebration dinner. This is a dinner we host for about 200 people and uh, we were having the international induction with FAF Motorsports uh, receiving that award with Chris FAF and Steve Bordelotti uh, accepting the awards and our congratulations to them for this, uh, this honor. But uh, we were pleased to have most of the team join us. I think we had 30 representatives from the FAF group. It was, it was a really wonderful evening. And we were pleased to also be joined by Derek Bell, who uh, and regaled us with uh, his tales of five decades of racing. And uh, it was a real special night. And the reason why we were able to attract Derek Bell, attract guys like Mario Andretti, attract some of the other celebrities that we've had here over the last few years is because of our association with the Hall of Fame. It's, uh, it's, it's obviously something that these gentlemen recognize, they support, and they come up here and join us because of our association. We want to thank you. And on behalf of our board of directors, uh, I wanted to thank uh, Dr. Hugh Scully for the initiating this, uh, this wonderful association. It's been great, and we were able to showcase some amazing cars together. For Peter to uh, be seeing us through this difficult year that we've uh, that we've had to pull this together, we want to thank you all very much for coming today, and I hope you enjoy this evening and enjoy the auto show. If you haven't had a chance to join it yet, hopefully you'll come back tomorrow, so our last day, and we're looking forward to another wonderful evening of events. Thank you again. Cheers. Thank you, Jason Campbell. A uh, couple of items to mention before we launch into the program. Please double check, make sure your phones are silenced. Some of us have unusual ringtones. We don't want any awkward <laughs> moments. Let's also please welcome Sharon Hepner and off to the side, Francine Herskovitz here this evening for the first time. They are interpreting our program for the deaf and hard of hearing. Thank you for joining us. We're pleased to note that the Hall of Fame will continue to be more inclusive in the future as well. In addition to all of us here in the John Bassett Theatre tonight, let's welcome all those watching the live stream broadcast once again in the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame YouTube channel. Thank you for joining us. 
While Canada doesn't have a huge population like some other countries, the ratio of highly talented and highly successful individuals in motorsport is significant, and it's only proper that we honor these individuals and their achievements. To begin this evening, let's welcome Peter Lockhart, the chair of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, with opening remarks. <clears throat> Thank you, Todd. Todd does an amazing job, so I, when you're looking for professionalism, look over there. This is my first time uh, up here. Uh, Hugh Scully did it, Dr. Hugh Scully did it for years, and uh, I can see him glaring at me from the fourth row. So uh, I'll, I'll muddle my way through it uh, with some, uh, with uh, just seeing how I can get it done. In any event, um, we are thrilled, absolutely thrilled to, to be back with the auto show. Uh, we're thrilled to be here in the John Bassett Theater, which gives us the opportunity to, to host a much larger gathering than, than uh, at the CBC. Uh, we're thrilled that we have uh, live streaming, uh, and that means that there's people all over the place, including one of our inductees in Australia who's, who's, uh, who's watching. Uh, it's, uh, it's an opportunity, uh, as we've all gone through COVID, uh, people are very familiar now with, with Zoom and uh, other method methodologies. And uh, it's, it's great to, uh, to have an even wider audience than we actually know. That said, uh, we've, uh, we've got a terrific program this evening. Uh, we have 13 great inductees. And uh, we, this is actually uh, the 30th year of, of the Hall of Fame. And in doing so, we reached back to see how it all started. And uh, it really started with Lee Abrahamson and Gary Magwood, uh, who's an honorary member. Uh, we reached out to Mr. Magwood, who's in a, on a beach in Mexico, and uh, he, uh, he wasn't coming back. And, uh, and Lee, uh, Lee was going to be here tonight. He's watching on, uh, uh, on live feed. Uh, unfortunately, he came down with COVID. So I, uh, I have uh, the notes and I have uh, the, uh, the pages that Mr. Magwood wrote about uh, the starting of the hall, and, and I, I will pick through it as best I can. Um, so, as I said, it started back in 1993, um, Lee uh, asking um, Gary, why is there no recognition for some of the world-class racing drivers that exist in Canada? And um, they turned to Len Coates, the, uh, uh, the legendary recognized uh, motor, motor journalist, and after a few meetings, an idea took shape. And the idea... Uh, they saw it had to be become a, a gala event, not to form a museum, uh, and a recognition process, which is essentially where we are today. Um, the idea of a gala dinner was, uh, was thought of as a method of paying for it all, uh, so that a lapel pin and a medallion could be cast and given to each inductee. Um, so the first uh, induction ceremony was a, was a black tie formal sit-down meal. Uh, and then what they wanted to do was arrange a special guest of honor. And they talked to Sterling, and Sterling wasn't really that receptive or enthusiastic at the time. And he uh, pushed them on to his good friend, John Surtees, who was far more accommodating, and uh, came over and uh, made all the media rounds and so on. And it was, uh, it was, it, that was the very beginning of this, of this whole, uh, whole gathering. And <clears throat> Dennis Morgan from the Star, uh, from the Wheels, uh, agreed to publish a story 10 consecutive weeks prior to the event. And, uh, and then they received commitments from the Star, Players, Molson, and Ford to buy tables of 10. And uh, then they created a selection committee uh, to make sure the nominees were chosen on merit, not friendship. And uh, they reduced it down to 10 a year uh, from uh, 20 individuals. And uh, they agreed that for the first five years they would induct 10. Um, you know, obviously, uh, that was 30 years ago. Uh, a lot has happened in, in the meantime, and uh, it's terrific. And we, we honestly, we thank Gary and Lee uh, for their initial thought to, to help make this thing happen. And today, uh, we have a, uh, a wonderful uh, board uh, that is, consists of 15 people. And um, some of those board members are here today. They're very, they're invaluable to the production of this event and to uh, our other events that we have at the hall. Um, so I'm going to ask our current board members to, to stand. Uh, and please hold your applause until I'm finished. Uh, Greg McPherson is our vice chair. Uh, Robin Virtue is our director and general manager. 
Joel Robinson, uh, Jeff Atkinson, uh, Denny Kadat, Scott Samuel, Michael Taylor, uh, Terry Dale, who I'm not sure is here, um, Bruce Thompson, our treasurer, and our thoughts are with Norris McDonald, uh, our director who has been ill and is recovering and is not here tonight. Uh, so thank you very much to our board for all that they do. We also, um, very fortunately and, uh, and, with, and we're very happy to, to know that at every gala uh, we have past members who attend. And uh, I believe it's a little tricky finding out who they are uh, because in block tickets, uh, not every name is, is present. So if I miss a name, I'm very sorry. But I believe that we have uh, Jim Bray here. Uh, I was told that Ed Hackinson and Dave Mathers were, were here. Lawrence Partington I definitely saw. Uh, Dr. Hugh Scully, uh, is our Chair Emeritus, is here. John McGill, our Honorary Board Director, uh, is here. Uh, and Eric Thomas, I'm not sure if Eric is in the house. Uh, I hope he is. Uh, he does a, a great amount of work for us. Uh, certainly Bruce uh, Mellenbacher and uh, John Waldy are here. So please give them a round of <laughs> So un unfortunately, and as, as time goes on, uh, a bit like the, uh, the early days of the movies, in the first year they didn't lose any actors. but. Uh, you know, 70 years later, they're, they're, they're dropping like flies. But uh, we, unfortunately, in the last year, uh, have had a number of members pass. And uh, I'd like to do, have a moment of silence uh, in their name. Some really uh, amazing people in, the, in, the, in that clip. Um, I'd also like to thank, I mentioned a second ago, Eric Thomas. Um, Eric is, uh, has been critical to the production of uh, his voicing of the induction videos and uh, with Dave Oliver as editor. Um, Eric is, of course, a member of the hall and a Canadian race line host, uh, so we thank him for that work. Um, our presenting sponsors tonight are Klubine Motorsports and OTSF Group. Uh, and there are others who supported the evening by buying ads in the program, um, including uh, Klubine and OTSF, FEL, Fast Eddie, Quaker State, uh, Riverside Raceway. And certainly I'd like to thank all those who supported the uh, silent auction, which is absolutely amazing looking at what's on, the, on that table. Um, the hall has uh, evolved dramatically from the days of uh, uh, Gary and, uh, and Lee. And um, as I mentioned, we have a, a really active board of 15 members. And we're becoming way more active in our social media and uh, programs. And we have Bryce Turner, our, our media manager, to thank for that. We have made a, a new 15 second uh, promo ad for the hall that will play on selected uh, racing shows on TSN and RDS in French throughout 2023. Uh, and uh, I'm not sure if we're showing that right now. 
The Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, celebrating 30 years of recognizing the efforts, achievements, and contributions the Canadians have made to the world of motorsports. Celebrate this country's great racing achievements. Go to cmhf.ca to nominate a Canadian you think is worthy. That's a nice, uh, nice video, Peter. I love seeing the hair and the sideburns in some of those as well. We, we, should, we should also mention the, um, the uh, Festival of Speed, which I know is uh, a great fundraiser for the hall and is back on the big track at CTMP this summer. Absolutely. Uh, one of the most fun things we do is something called Celebration of Speed. Uh, and simply put, it's a, a group of volunteer drivers with very nice cars who show up to give the public rides. Uh, the public uh, buy tickets online. Uh, each ticket is uh, good for four sessions of three laps each. And in 2023, on May 15th, uh, we are back at uh, Canadian Tire Motorsport Park on the Grand Prix circuit, which is extremely exciting. Uh, what happens when someone sits in a McLaren for the first time is one thing, but when they sit in a McLaren and they're taken around the track, uh, at, uh, at speed uh, is another. And uh, it's one of the reasons why the uh, ride-along drivers volunteer their cars, their tires, their brakes, and their gas, because each and every one of them always tells us uh, the joy they get in seeing the reaction of their, of their passengers. So we are, uh, we are very, very happy to be back uh, at uh, Canadian Tire Motorsport Park. Uh, Monday, May 15th. Uh, by the end of March or so, uh, tickets will be available um, online on the Hall's website. Look for that coming up in May. Peter, thank you uh, so much. We'll uh, hear from you again a little bit later and uh, looking forward to another great celebration of speed at uh, Canadian Tire Motorsport Park. A um, couple of other items to mention as well having to do with the Motorsport Hall of Fame and the nomination process, which is changing and being streamlined now as part of the Hall's website. Nominations will now be open year-round on the webpage. We'll have a nominations option. There's a drop-down menu and an FAQ page as well with a sample for you to look at for the submission form. Also posted will be the scoring matrices on how the independent selection committee scores those that are nominated. Nominations that will be cut off at the end of July for the current year. Any that come after will be considered for the following year. Nominations received and scored are forwarded to the board without names. A cutoff score is agreed and then the names are disclosed to the board. The chair of the nominating committee will contact successful nominee and names will be announced as part of a press release. The successful nominees then of course honored at an induction ceremony, much like this one. We should also note that the directors of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame and the Independent Selection Committee are not allowed to nominate or support any nomination. Okay. Todd, I, I, one thing that I didn't mention and wanted to um, was that one of our directors, um, Michael Taylor, uh, is the executive uh, producer of an up-and-coming film titled Villeneuve Peroni, uh, Racing's Untold Tragedy. This uh, is, a, is an amazing story of Gilles Villeneuve back in the day uh, with team orders and uh, and, and it's, a, it's, a sad, it's a sad story, and the background of it is uh, apparently, I mean, it's a, it is sad, but I'm sure this is going to be a, a, a very epic film. Um, Michael is one of the executive uh, producers of this film, and it's going to premiere on HBO Canada or Crave on TV in, uh, on April the 7th, and uh, will premiere later in the US on HBO. Thank you, Peter. I hesitated so much to do this. I don't want it to be hurtful to anyone. Gilles and this daredevil persona. She decided to buy the package. Well, she didn't have the choice. <laughs> he was a natural born racer. Didier was courageous. Very charismatic. His focus was laser-like. Je suis Lucie Ferrari pour essayer de gagner des courses. 
two friends in their own world. But destiny decides something else. Jill was seeing 82 as his season. He didn't need to worry about his teammate. This story is about betrayal. For Jill, it was all about friendship. I've declared war. Emotion is dangerous. The car went like this, beside me. On the edge, all the time. It's amazing adrenaline. It really had a huge impact on who I then became. Who was your father? What was the real story? What you see is not what you're going to get. We'll look forward to seeing that. In addition to many worthy candidates and inductees celebrated from Canada, the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame also has an international category to recognize significant accomplishments of individuals, companies, and organizations from around the world that have achieved outstanding success in motorsports. Please welcome Dr. Hugh Scully, and if he's here, I'm not sure if he is, Terry Dale, to come to the stage to present Wally Dahlenbach Sr. as the 2021 International Inductee. I know. I don't think Terry's here. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Todd. <clears throat> uh, Terry Dale was going to try and be here because he had a lot of work that he did uh, with uh, Wally. I got to know Wally when I was the uh, medical director for all of the kart and indie races here for the first uh, 34 years and in race control. And Wally and the Americans did not have a model where you had a medical director in race control with the rescue coordinator and the race director but he instantly recognized that it improved communication tremendously and made the management of accidents much smoother and more easy. And he supported that all along the way. I spent a lot of time in race control and Formula One around the world with uh, traveling with Sid Watkins and many other places. And that model was adopted and held fast in Formula One. I would say though that Wally as a race director um, was perhaps the best that I ever worked with. Calm, decisive, experienced, tremendous uh, driver, very knowledgeable about racing, and without question, when the international category came up a couple of years ago, I recommended Wally for entry into this Hall of Fame, and he was very pleased and honored to accept I do believe we have a video. We do have a video, and congratulations to Wally Dahlenbach, Sr. Hello to all my Canadian friends, and I'm sorry that uh, I can't attend this prestigious award, but uh, it means very much to me, and I'm going to share with the rest of my colleagues in car, past and present. And uh, I would just want to thank you again for honoring me and uh, who I represent. And uh, we always had uh, a great relationship uh, uh, preparing a, a race in Canada together as a family. And we uh, have memories, uh, of good things to eat, good things to see, and good people to be with. And I just want to thank you again and wish I could be there. As I said, uh, 
Wally was very pleased, as was his family. Wally clearly is uh, not well, not able to travel, so he was not able to join us, and we were able to get this video. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Hugh. The 2022 International Inductee was presented their award on Wednesday, February the 15th, at the Cobble Beach Collector's Dinner prior to the Canadian International Auto Show. Watch the video, please. The name Pfaff has been racing as long as it's been selling cars. Hans J. Pfaff started Pfaff Automotive in 1964 with a desire to provide the best customer service experience in the industry. Chris Pfaff put those same goals to work with the Pfaff Motorsports brand. Their big breakout was in the Rothmans Porsche Turbo Cup Series in the 1980s where the team won a championship with Hall of Famer Scott Goodyear in 1988. In 2014, an effort was brought forth to build an in-house team. Over the past decade, Pfaff Motorsports has been one of the most successful sports car racing teams in North America. They've led over 5,000 laps, 35 race wins, 36 pole positions, and seven championships, a record of achievement capped by two consecutive IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championships in GTD and GTD Pro in their iconic Canadian theme number no. nine plaid Porsche. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the 2022 international inductee to the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, FAF Motorsports. Steve Bordelotti is in the house. Uh, could you come up and say a few words? Steve is the general manager of FAF Motorsport, and he's done an amazing job putting this program together. Congratulations, Steve. Thank you. Um, it, it's an incredible honor for, you know, for the entire FAF Motorsports organization to, to be inducted into the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame. You know, I'm honored to, to stand up here and accept the award on the team's behalf, but this has been uh, many, many years in the making and you know, a lot of you know, not just time and effort and investment from, from everybody at the company to, uh, to get here and the belief in the fact that you know, the sport we all know and love does actually something for our business as well and helps us sell cars. So um, our, story is long from, uh, our story is long from over. Hopefully we have uh, many more amazing memories to write and accomplishments to, to make Canada proud. So I thought while we had Steve here, we could clear up a little issue of, of how the car, how this absolutely winning car ended up being plaid. So the, uh, the plaid livery came, I wouldn't say by accident, but we, uh, in 2019, when we entered the IMSA WeatherTech Sports Car Championship, our then sponsor, Castrol, was was wanting to change the livery on the car, but they were indecisive kind of as to, to what that was gonna look like. So um, we were at the shop, it was your typical minus 30 with the wind chill uh, day. In Canada, when we were loading the trailer actually to go to the Roar, uh, which is the test before the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Um, and the car was just wrapped all red because we didn't have any direction at that point. And you know, Lawrence Yap and myself, um, and a few others, Zach Robichon was there. We, we looked around and everyone was wearing plaid and we said, you know, it'd be kind of cool to, to do something Canadian without waving a Canadian flag and a bunch of Americans' faces. That usually doesn't go over well. Uh, so we, we thought, you know, maybe it'd be cool to do a, a plaid, plaid car. So Lawrence was able to, he's quite good with Photoshop, so he was able to Photoshop our car with, with the plaid design on it. And we said, okay, that, that might work. And we, we submitted an email to, to Chris Pfaff and got a, I don't get it, but you guys seem very passionate about this, so I'll let you go with it. And yeah, from that point, it was an instant fan favorite. We, uh, um, the, the merchandise sales that we see now from, from the Plaid and you know, the, the folks at Toronto Motorsport, Derek over there and his team have done an amazing job kind of bringing it to life. And now it's a line item in my budget I actually have to think about and, and, uh, and care about. So you know, the, the fanfare has been amazing and it's something that we, uh, we hope does Canada proud and, and we can continue to win championships for, for many years to come. Thank you, Steve, and uh, so much for uh, not waving it in their face, huh? <laughs> eh? <laughs> Thanks very much. Congratulations, Steve. Congratulations, Fav Motorsports. 
Let's continue to honour this year's Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame inductees. Members are recognised as builders, competitors, significant contributors and media. Many of tonight's honorees are recognised in multiple categories for their influence and support of Canadian motorsports. We have new members that are involved from sports cars, stock cars, rallies, motorcycles, media, other facets of racing, 13 new members. So let's begin to meet them. Our first inductee. AIM Autosport experienced success in sports cars and open wheel during a quarter century of operating multi-car teams. The organization started in Formula 1600 in 1995 and continued to dominate for the next eight years using the Willis Brothers' own Aero 2 chassis. AIM won four championships in 1600 competition before expanding efforts to other series, winning two titles between US F2000, Formula Renault, Formula BMW, and Star Mazda. The team finished fifth in their debut 24 Hours of Daytona appearance in 2007. In total, they recorded two overall wins and five podiums over five seasons in the Daytona prototype class. AIM Autosport won three straight GT class championships for Ferrari from 2012 to 2014. In 2015, while running the Nissan GTR GT3 program in the Pirelli World Challenge Series, AIM was named the most successful Nissan run team globally. During 2019 to 2020, the organization operated a Lexus program competing in the IMSA GTD division, garnering six wins and 12 podium finishes. The AIM Autosport team consists of Andrew Bourdain, Ian Willis, and Keith Willis, who not only prepare cars for racing, but also educate many individuals behind the wheel and mechanics and engineers in the motorsport industry. Many notable drivers have competed for AIM over the years, including L.P. Dumoulin, James Hinchcliffe, Kyle Marcelli, Daniel Morad, Andrew Ranger, and Mark Wilkins. Please welcome into the 2020 class of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, AIM Principals, Andrew Bourdine, Ian Willis, and Keith Willis. And we have in the house Mark Wilkins tonight, who uh, will be the presenter, who has a long history and a, a very successful racer. Thank you, Mark. Thank you. Okay, this is uh, for Ian. Okay, for Keith. And Andrew. Thank you. Come on over here, let's get a uh, photo. Um, uh, first things first, I'd like to uh, thank the committee for, um, for uh, choosing us to be in inducted into the Hall of Fame. Um, I just want to say that, um, you know, first things first, I think I've been, I've been blessed to, to spend the majority of my life racing and uh, a lot of time at the track. Um, the life lessons uh, that it's taught me are... Uh, in, it, it, they're just unbelievable, and and to do it with some people that you truly, truly um, love, I think is super important. Um, uh, we've only got five minutes, right? Yeah. <laughs> just a brief history on a model sport is like a Reader's Digest version. Um, I had to select a car to race in Formula Ford at the age of uh, I think it was 18, so I um, so I had to choose between the the Aero Two and a Van Diemen. So tried the car out and I, uh, and I selected uh, the car that the Willis brothers built and uh, the car really truly turned out to be an amazing car. I mean, a lot of guys like Rob McDonald, Mark Wilkins, you saw James Hinchcliffe. I mean, we won multiple championships um, and so on and so on. So after we, uh, we won a bunch of championships, a bunch of people or, or a bunch of drivers would come and ask us, you know, can we, uh, can we buy the car? Can we rent the car? And, and that's kind of how we started the uh, that's kind of how AIM started, but, um, but uh, 
throughout the years, it's just been an amazing journey. And I want to thank these, uh, I want to thank my partners. I want to thank Teresa Proto. Somewhere there's a lot of lights here, I can't see you. Teresa, thank you for being the backbone of our, uh, of our company and uh, all the guys, all the guys back there. We have some great stories that we'll com continue to talk about and repeat over and over and over and over. So guys, just thank you very much and I'm truly honored, thank you. Um, a Motorsports a race team, but um, our race team is a family and uh, we couldn't do this out without, without our families. And um, there's a couple of families that were very instrumental in the development of A Motorsport. Um, Andrew's family, Andrew's father, Fortunato, who believed in the idea that we had of growing the racing team as well as Andrew's career. And then the Wilkins family who decided we'd like to go endurance sports car racing after all we'd done is open wheel. And that opened up a whole new, um, a whole new avenue for us uh, to, to compete uh, internationally. And uh, for that, we're forever grateful. Um, and then the families we have uh, that Andrew's already talked about, the sacrifices that are made um, for the people that are at home waiting for us to come back from being on the road. Um, I really appreciate the sacrifice that everyone's made for us over the years. Thank you. It's, it's like Ian and uh, Andrew said, it's the, uh, all the people involved. You know, we have to give thanks to a lot of our mechanics that have been with us for many, many years. Uh, Steve, Bill, uh, everybody listed. Jeff, there's like a thousand and one people listed that, you know, they were their mainstay. And uh, all the new people that are coming through racing that are uh, being involved with uh, in the future, again, you know, keep at it. It's, it's, uh, it's a great business to be with. It's uh, important, it's family, everybody here, you hear stories. Everybody's talked about, you know, 10 years ago, five years ago, 100 years ago, we did all this stuff. It's n nothing's new today. So again, thank you all. Congratulations, Andrew Bourdain, Ian Willis, Keith Willis, Mark Wilkins, nice to have you here presenting as well. Congratulations, guys. Our next inductee is in the media category. This inductee started his media career as a self-taught photographer working as a track photog and reporter at Saskatoon International Raceway in 1974. Bruce Beagler focused his work on drag racing in the years that followed, spending time as a photographer and writer for National Dragster and Wheel Spin News. He was the drag racing editor for Performance Racing News from 1989 to 2008 and for Inside Track Motorsport News from 2009 to 2014. He was a contributing editor for Chrysler's official factory publication, Mopar Magazine, for 30 years and has worked on content for other drag racing and industry publications. He founded DragRaceCanada.com in 1999, which has become a reputable and popular website for drag racing in Canada. He continues to serve as editor for the website, traveling to cover races across Canada and the U.S. throughout his career, including major events such as the NHRA U.S. Nationals at Indianapolis. A top drag racing journalist and ambassador, please welcome to the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, Bruce Beagler. The presenter for Bruce Beagler is Wally Clark, who is joining us up on stage now to accept the medallion from Peter Lockhart. We'll let these two take their photos. Unfortunately, Bruce is unable to be with us tonight. He is far, far away. But we do have a video message from Bruce that he wanted to share with everyone. Greetings to my beloved homeland Canada from Brisbane, Australia, everyone. Hope you're all enjoying your evening. I sincerely regret not being able to join you in person tonight, but life's circumstance combined with the very long distance to travel back to Canada at this time has prevented me from doing that. Let me first offer my sincere congratulations to all of the other inductees this evening. I'm sure that you were all just as thrilled as I was when you first heard the news. I'd like to take this opportunity to give a special shout out to Uli Berry, who is also being inducted into the Canadian 
Motorsports Hall of Fame tonight. I had the pleasure of working with Uli and his Cayuga Dragway staff for approximately two decades. Congratulations, Uli, and thank you for all you did for me. To think that my name could ever be mentioned in the same grouping of previous Canadian Motorsports Hall of Fame drag racing inductees, names like Gordy Bonin, Ron Hudson, Terry Cap, Dale Armstrong, and Barry Payton is just humbling. A huge thank you to the Canadian Motorsports Hall of Fame nomination committee for this kind recognition. I accept it both personally, but also on behalf of the entire uh, Canadian drag racing community in Canada. My serious involvement in drag racing did in fact evolve from a short experience as a minor level driver. That did have a short shelf life and ended with a broken motor and a maxed out credit card. Despite my ambition, I realized soon that for me to remain involved in the sport of my choice, I had to change direction, so I elected to pursue a photography and journalism path for drag racing instead. I guess it was a situation of having a Nikon instead of Nitro, so to speak. Over a couple of years that followed, various doors of opportunity opened for me as I migrated away from being a track photographer at Saskatoon International Raceway, south of Saskatoon, and to the print pages of National Dragster and Wheelspin News. After moving to Ontario, and with personal guides from none other than legendary NHRA's chief photographer, Leslie Lovett, who was my mentor, I did begin an extensive and frequent regimen of season travel into the United States while honing and accelerating my craft and photographic art for both the NHRA and the IHRA. That led to some rewarding contributing editor stints with many major publications, including Car Craft, Hot Rod, Popular Hot Rodding, Super Chevy, Chevy High Performance, Drag View, and very, very prominent with Mopar's factory magazine, Mopar Magazine. All of that helped until new opportunities for me in Canada, and I was thrilled to be selected to be the drag racing editor for both of Canada's two primary racing publications, first Performance Racing News, and then Inside Track Magazine. In 1999, with the onset of the internet absorbing motorsports too, I found at DragRaceCanada.com. Since then, I've tried to use it to give the sport of drag racing in Canada what it truly deserved, prominence and respect within the overall motorsports community. Needless to say, I was pleased and very proud that eventually Drag Race Canada became what it is and rose to where it did. It was fully embraced by the drag racing community and gained recognition worldwide as the official voice for drag racing from Canada. I would be remiss if I didn't mention all the sponsorship help Drag Race Canada had throughout that journey. But to be honest, that is a very, very, very long list. Just too many to cite this evening, but a sincere thank you to all of you. Drag Race Canada would never have been possible without a network of community of friends within drag racing, including support from accomplished photographers and my good friends like Dave DeAngelis and Steve Emling and my highly valued webmaster Todd Payton and he who also you know is a star racer. We all benefit greatly from the long-term primary involvement of presenting sponsors Mopar Canada and Lucas Oil Canada who shared our vision about the importance of our online product to the Canadian market. My ventures all over Canada and the world resulted in countless interactions with racers and race track ownership. In fact, the real reason I am receiving this honour today is a testament to exactly that. During my career, I enjoyed the great friendships I developed, all the creative people I met, the incredible technology I witnessed, and being given the opportunity for, to, of art form for photographing what are hands down the coolest cars anywhere on our particular planet to photograph. Thank you to all drag racing drivers, drag racing teams, sanctioning bodies, and drag strip management for giving me the opportunity and also the, that basis for all my stories I reported and filed. So moving internationally, I have fielded a few queries about the future of DragRaceCanada.com because of exactly that. While I can't yet be specific, being sure that I'm working hard to continue and position the site to the spot where, with the proper partners found, it can remain and advance as Canada's undisputed number one for the sport into the future. And it will also remain part of my overall LMLC media portfolio, online portfolio. I have now migrated permanently to Australia, fulfilling a lifelong dream from my wife, Myrna, and myself to retire here. We're uh, moving to along Queensland's Sunshine Coast with uh, board shorts and sandals on and my golf clubs in tow. But wait, did I say retire? Hmm. Truthfully, my involvement with drag racing is probably a never ending story. Maybe scaled back would be more accurate. And in fact, I've, I'm already involved with Drag News 
Australia's primary online uh, entity, and we'll continue doing work with them. Lastly, a sincere thank you to my longtime friend and very accomplished drag racer, Wally Clark, who is in attendance tonight, and we're graciously standing in for me. Here's signing off from the future. It's uh, tomorrow here for you guys, and I hope everyone enjoys this evening's gala. Cheers and good day, mates. Good evening. I won't take that long. <laughs> um, as drag racers, our accomplishments are measured in seconds and milliseconds. And there's a lot can and does happen in that short period of time. And Bruce was one of those elite journalists that would take that action and what would normally disappear into the air. Bruce would take that as a journalist and he was one of the elite that would put that into a form of writing and make it live forever. And uh, Bruce, congratulations on your induction into the Canadian Motorsports Hall of Fame. I've often thought you, you never got enough credit for the work you did for Canadian drag racers. I mean, if you were a drag racer and you were from Canada, trust me, Bruce knew about you. And um, tonight, Bruce, you've uh, really got what you've deserved. You've uh, well deserved it. and. We owe it to you, buddy. And uh, with that, all I got to say is good day, mate, and good night, everybody. Thank you. Thanks, Thank Bob. you, Wally. Congratulations to Bruce Beegler. Let's meet our next inductee who qualifies in the competitor and the builder category. Our next inductee enters the hall in the racer and builder category. As an 18-year-old apprentice in Switzerland, this young mechanic got hit with a motorsport bug. His shop boss was the driver, and a young Uli Bieri was the crew chief. Soon the young apprentice moved into the driver's seat. The young Bieri soon moved to Canada, got his racing license, and started competing in endurance racing. He would race globally for a number of years in Africa, North America, South America, and in Europe. He raced professionally from the early 1980s to mid-1990s, competing in over 57 events, including nine appearances in the 24 Hours of Daytona. He was the Canadian Endurance Champion in 1985 and 1986, and has also driven a BMW M1 factory car. Uli was a top competitor in the Rothmans Porsche Turbo Cup Series in the 1990s. In 1991, Bieri purchased Toronto Motorsports Park with a group of four investors. The drag strip was reopened the following year while a road course was added in 2003. The track hosted the IHRA for five years in the early 2000s and regained NHRA sanction in 2011, starting the NHRA National Open in 2015. To this day, Toronto Motorsport Park is a busy, multifaceted facility servicing the motorsport community in southwestern Ontario. Please welcome into the 2022 Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, Uli Vieri. Presenting Uli Vieri's medallion is Jen Vieri. Wow, very, very honored to be here tonight, being here on stage with all of you. I'm a very shy and don't like being in the spotlight. So this is a, a bit, uh, sorry, this is a bit of uh, experience for me. Many of you might know that I was born and raised on a farm in uh, Switzerland. 
I had seven siblings. I could have never imagined having an international racing career and now being honored in motorsports. I always had a passion for cars, racing, speed. I like many of you here today. When I look back on my racing career, traveling all over the world with my friends and small budget, completing against the best in the world. It's amazing with so much heart and a visit to the world. It's amazing with so much heart and a vision to, sorry, be the best. Whether it was driving a BMW, Alba, Taiga prototype, endurance race, Sebring 24 hour race, Daytona 24 hour race, Rotman's Porsche Turbo Cup Series. When I bought Toronto Motorsports Park in the early 90s, or Cayuga Dragway Park at that time, I wanted to be able to be able to have fun racing cars in an affordable way. It was only a track slip then, and we added the road course, which was a huge pain in the ass for me at that time. <laughs> and went to a lot of problems with it, but at the end of the day, it was extremely worthwhile what we were able to achieve. Being inducted in the Hall of Fame has been incredibly humbling me. From the people who wrote the letters of recommendation, I have never felt more honored as I also admire you. And uh, reading those letters was truly touching. You had me in tears. Thank you for taking the time and writing them. Thank you to all the racers and the community for believing in the support, my dream. Your ex ex uh, excitement makes me all worthwhile. Thank you to all my staff who have been with me for many, many years. Without your passion and effort, one of this would have been possible. Thank you for teaching me everything I know about drag racing and for loving the track as much as I do. Thank you to all my family and friends for supporting me through the good and the bad. And thank you to everyone who come tonight. I'm truly honored and grateful to be here with you. I hope you have fun and thanks for celebrating with me. Yahoo, thank you, thank you. Congratulations, Uli Bieri. Thank you, Jen. Our next inductee falls into the competitor, builder, and contributor categories. Our next inductee started racing in the Players GM Series in 1986 before scoring multiple wins and podiums in the Firestone Firehawk Endurance Series and the Canadian Endurance Championship between 1989 and 1991. He then went open wheel racing in the Canadian Formula 2000 Series and the Ultra Competitive 1600 Series. Success in Formula 1600 led to opportunities to test for Brian Stewart's Indy Lights program. In 2003, he would get back behind the wheel of the iconic Brummel's Porsche in the 24 hours of Daytona. Co-drivers included David Donahue and Randy Post. After retiring from racing, Chris Bice supported other Canadian drivers through his role as president of Fell. The company was James Hinchcliffe's first sponsor in Formula BMW in 2004 and has supported other notable drivers including James Vance, Daniel Morad and Scott Hargrove. Chris has supported many Canadian drivers' dreams by supporting their sports car careers. Most recently, Bai led Fell through the creation of Fell Motorsports, which launched the Sports Car Championship Canada and promotes the Radical Canada Series. Please welcome, as a motorsport builder and competitor of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, Chris Bai.
joining Chris Bai is Haley Bai. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, Todd. I'll make it quick so I can get back to Florida. I'm uh, super honored to be a member of this club. Over my many years, I've been uh, a member of a few exclusive clubs, some good and some not so good. <laughs> I'm kidding, none of them were good. Um, thanks. Uh, thanks to the Hall, the Selection Committee, my friends, Mr. Lockhart, of course, uh, Joel Robinson, Jeff Atkinson, everyone else. Thanks to Jen McAllister for submitting the, <clears throat> the application and uh, Scott Goodyear for supporting it. Checks in the mail, Scotty. Um, so many, so much to be, <clears throat> to be grateful for. So many great memories, like sharing a podium on multiple occasions with, with Greg Moore Winning the Toronto Star 24 hours of most port in a Porsche was awesome, 1991, I think, with uh, Terry Batts, Raymond David, rest in peace, Raymond, and my brother Rick. Shout out to my brother Rick for many, many races in a Porsche, had tons of success, was great. Um, and then being a Porsche fan of uh, both on and off the racetrack, to get a call from Primoz uh, was <clears throat> definitely super special. And for that, I owe giant thanks to Dan Davis, Jim France, Bob Snodgrass, rest in peace, Bob, and someone I'm super proud to call a friend, Hurley Haywood. We, uh, I retired in 96 the first time, and Hurley and I started talking in 02, and then we put a deal together to do the Rolex in 2003. And uh, we went testing. Brumos brought on Alex Job to run our car. Alex is one of the most successful Porsche sports car owners in history, and he's very serious. So we went to Daytona. We had some pulse, so we did a lot of testing there. Um, Alex said the car was brand new, so Alex said, okay, gee, you guys are going to go out and do 10 laps. So David Donahue went out, did 10, came in. Borkowski, Mike Borkowski went out, did 10 laps and came in. I went out <clears throat> to get my fat ass strapped in the car. And I leave pit lane, and I feel like I'm in the car for like an hour. And I can't breathe, my arms are sore, I can't hold my head up. It's hot, sweat's running in my eyes. And I'm like, did they forget about me? Or they, maybe they're working on the 59 car. So I'm going through the tri-oval and I got on the radio and said, am I done? And Alex comes back and says, uh, I said 10 laps. That was lap three. Lap three, seven to go. <laughs> I said, D -d did you mean like in a row? Like all at the same time? I'm tired. <laughs> so I had a great, we led the first eight hours and uh, suffered a mechanical, but um, yeah, it was a great experience. On the commercial side, super proud of our, our um, support of 1600. 1600 was a big part of my life. Robbie McDonald and I were teammates in 1995. First race at Mosport, Canadian Tire Mosport Park, Robbie says to me after qualifying, he goes, you know what I just realized? I'm like, what? He said, the year uh, that uh, you started racing was the year I was born. I'm like, yep. <laughs> uh, so a lot of Bob was a uh, was a sponsor. Thanks, Bob, and congratulations on your induction. Um, super proud to support Canadian drivers James Hinchcliffe, uh, Scott Hargrove, Steph Rzinski, um James Vance, who's making a living full-time in Florida with uh, Fast MD Racing, so congrats to James, and uh, Zach Robichon through, through uh, our association with FAF. Um, incredibly proud to <coughs> have the FEL branding on the plaid car. Big shout out to Steve Bordelotti, I know you're out there somewhere and Chris Pfaff, um, man, you guys absolutely kill it. The entire team, you guys, are, you guys have done some special stuff for a small team from Canada to go and turn the sports car world upside down. It's, uh, it's been awesome, and, it's, uh, and thanks for allowing us to do, do our small part. Um, you know, racing's been super good to me, and it's been great to, to give back to some of the younger drivers, and uh, we'll continue to do so. Super proud of the job that Jessica Benavides has done with her team at FEL Motorsports. It's been uh, super challenging. I said to uh, Kathy during COVID, I said, hey, you know, we should start a couple of race series. It'll be fun and we'll make lots of money. Well, our business was decimated. And I said, well, at least I was half right. Um, through all the twists and turns and the thick ice and thin, and believe me, 
there's been a lot of thin. There's been one constant in my life. Kathy and I met in grade six. I was 18. <laughs> Her parents moved her across town. We connected in high school, high school, the best eight years of my life. So we decided to make it official in 1986, so we flew to Jamaica, and they had a beer drinking contest on the bus from the airport to our hotel, and this guy kicked my ass. And those of you who know me can imagine how impressed I was. So I said, what are you doing tomorrow night at 6 o'clock? He said, I don't know why. I said, I'm getting married. Do you want to be my best man? And he said, sure. So his wife stood up for Kathy. So we got married in Jamaica, had a great time. Uh, we came home. When we got home, Kathy's sister had gotten married sometime before us in one of those big, fancy, traditional, expensive weddings that don't work. <laughs> and there was only half of you laughing. <laughs> the other half are going, my ex-wife's got my race car. <laughs> and she sold it to a guy I hate. <laughs> so her parents uh, gave us a big bag of money, uh, equal to what they spent on her sister's wedding, and my parents gave us a bag of money. So I did what any reasonable, responsible, newlywed husband would do to secure the financial future of its new family. I took every dollar of those two bags of money, and I invested them soundly. Oh, yes, I did. To those of you who said, no, you didn't, <laughs> in a race car. Okay, it was, it was a player's GM card, but it had numbers. And don't get me wrong, I love what GM's done and what Ron and, and GM have done together to put the stamp on uh, a motorsports with a Cor Corvette brand is, is spectacular. And I also left my stamp uh, in the sport in 1986 in player's GM. It was my rear license plate stamped in the bottom of four in the guardrail. But I figure it's kind of the same. Um, I crashed it the first time I sat in it, so that was awesome. And that was like the highlight of our year, because I think they sold like 800 Camaros. Um, so then in 1990, we were really broke. Um, we were building a house three times bigger than what we could afford. We may have fibbed a little bit to the bank about how much money we had. So we were closing first week of January, so I uh, talked to my financial advisor, for those of you who haven't figured that out yet, and uh, had a great plan. So I borrowed 25,000 US dollars, and on Boxing Day with my Uncle Ted, who's here tonight, and my brother Rick jumped in my cube van and drove to Miami. And I invested those 25,000 US dollars soundly in a race car. <laughs> and oh yes, she would to so all you guys whose wives just leaned over and said, I would kill you in your sleep. <laughs> She'd stab you in the heart or go our Lorena Bobbitt on you, which would not be ideal. Fingers don't work. Um, you know, not once during all of these times did, did, did Kathy look at me and say, what the hell is wrong with you? She, she actually says that a lot, and still does. So, um, you know, Kathy, thank you for the endless support, support and for believing in me when uh, at times I didn't believe in myself. It's worked out. Again, we've, uh, it's been, uh, it, it hasn't been easy, and uh, it, uh, it's, it's been unsteady at times, and it, it, ha it certainly hasn't uh, been easy, but it's been awesome. Thank you for giving me uh, my, my proudest accomplishment. Haley, we, my, your mom and dad love you so much. When you came to us when you were 15 and said you wanted to go to Africa without us, I knew we had done something special. <laughs> we are so proud of the young, caring woman you've become, and uh, thank you and Kenny for giving us Frank the Tank. <laughs> to uh, my extended FEL family, who are a whole bunch of you here, um, thank you for doing uh, an impossible, making an impossible task, and that is making me look good every single day. You guys absolutely rock, and. Uh, <clears throat> I could not be more proud to, to play my small role in what we do, and we do some pretty amazing things together, so thank you for that. And uh, Catherine, from the first time we w w drove through the, through the tunnel together at Canadian Tire Motorsport Park in 1978 to today, you are hands down still the hottest chick in the planet, uh, in the paddock. Thanks, everyone.
Congratulations, Chris. Let's move on to our next inductee who is a competitor for many, many years. Our next inductee has been racing stock cars since the late 1960s at 46 different tracks in both Canada and the United States. Known as the Iron Man, this Ontario racer first got into racing through demo derbies and vintage modifieds. Since then, he has raced stock cars for 55 seasons, including an historic 50 years with sponsor Quaker State. Gary Elliott competed on 859 consecutive race nights in the divisions that he's run, dating back to 1987. He's recorded 260 wins, 40 feature wins, 25 top five finishes, and two championships over his career. He is also a 12-time winner of the Most Sportsmanlike Driver Award. Away from the track, Elliott has made presentations to high school auto shop groups and has helped with racing seminars at a summer racing camp. He's also served on the Canadian Vintage Modifieds Committee for 25 years, spending seven years as president of the Canadian Vintage Modified Club. Please welcome the Iron Man, Gary Elliott, to the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame. Well, thank you very much. Um, I'm really humbled to be here tonight, and I'm very thankful. Uh, this has been a long journey, and it's still going. I haven't quit racing yet. I don't, I don't intend to for a, quite a while until the passion leaves or until God tells me it's time to stop. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for coming to this unbelievable uh, event. I'm so honored and proud and humbled to be part of this. Thank you to all the committee that have uh, have uh, inducted me into this, and uh, to all the other inductees, congratulations on such an honor to be part of this Canadian Motorsports Hall of Fame, and I'm so very thankful. Uh, I have uh, 18 people here came tonight, and I just have to tell you who they are. So my son, David, and his wife, Jeannie, my daughter and her husband, my daughter, Shirley, and her husband, Garrick, my Derek, my two grandkids, Lauren and Garrick, um, Jim has been with me, uh, my crew chief, for 20 years, and my best friend. Danny Huff has followed my son and I for racing for 20 years, and he nominated me, and I'm so thankful for Danny, and he's here tonight. Two of my pit crew came from Nova Scotia. I moved to Nova Scotia in 2019, and two guys came, with uh, Chris White, and, uh, and then also uh, Jack Lind and his wife, and his, <laughs> not yet, and his fiance. Uh, Jada, they're both here too as well. And uh, two of my sponsors are here. They came tonight as well. Uh, Jay and Colleen Lind, Lindy from Grindstone Landscaping. And then Dennis Duvall and Craig Tozer from a, a motorsport, motor city, motor, motor city Madness board game, which uh, are my sponsors. And I'm so thankful. So thank you all for you guys for coming and, and being here to celebrate this with me. Um, racing is impossible without sponsors, and I'm so proud to have all these people support me, including I would like my former wife also. She was so supportive of me. And uh, my girlfriend, uh, Shannon Riley, she's here tonight, and she's supporting me as well. Um, I I'm just so thankful for all the people that have been around. I started going to races when I was five years old. So back in the early 60s, no, 50s, sorry, I was 50s, I'm older than that. And uh, so when I'd go home after the races, uh, my parents, my mom had a big oval rug, and it was perfect because the oval rug, if you remember back in the 50s, they were different colors, so it acted like a racetrack. So I was able to push all my little cars around there, and I, I finally got in it, and I, I, really, uh, I really just wanted to race, that's all I wanted to do. So I started racing demolition derbies, 
And I know that was the first picture that you saw there. So you don't really erase them. You kind of wreck them. That's the whole point. You go out there and destroy them. And then you hope at the end of the day that you put on the best show so that you didn't sit in the corner and pretend that your car wouldn't start and then show up and wreck everybody else and take the, take the victory. So I didn't do that. I went out there and just destroyed my car. And, and I had fun doing that. But then when I started stock car racing in 1969, I realized I had to forget about the demolition derby experience and go out there and race and have fun and take care of my car. So in 1969, I started racing at Cayuga Speedway and the mini stock division. And it wasn't going to be easy because uh, I didn't have a garage. We worked in the backyard of my father-in-law's place for three years, no garage. So we didn't work in the car from November until April till the snow went away. And then we started working on the car and it was covered with snow and leaves and rust and everything else. But that's where we, that's called grassroots racing. If you don't have a garage and you want to race, then you have to make something out of a garage. I had so many Volkswagens in the backyard of my father-in-law's place, he was getting a German accent. So it was just... <laughs> so in 1972, I moved to the Coupes. You've seen the, the Coupes up there. I moved to the Canadian Vintage Modifieds. I raced there for 33 years. And um, in 1989, after... From 1969 to 89, 21 full seasons, I finally won my first championship. And it was probably the most glorious thing I could have done. I thank God for for winning that championship because I only won it by four points. It was a 30 night rate, a 30 night schedule, and we we were the champions at the end of the year. My son had joined racing as well, so I was so thankful that he came. And in 1992, my my daughter started racing. She was the first full time lady to race in the Canadian Vintage Modifieds, and she ran for one year. Then she returned about five or six years later to run against to run against other women and what they called the powder puff so it was all ladies and she smoked them all she she just she was really good at, at racing and she raced hard my son i'm so proud of him he won 14 championships over his career and he could maybe be here, here as well but well he is here so i mean but whether he gets inducted or not i don't know but he's he's really done it fantastic with his career so my career stats so far i'm just going to just read them to you so that from 1969 until the end of this season, we have 1,318 total nights. Uh, we have 875 consecutive nights. So in 1987, my dad died on the long weekend in May. And when we went to Sobble Speedway, I got involved in a bit of an accident with another racer. And he really wasn't nice to me. He told me a few things that I can't repeat here. So anyway, I got into a fight with him and I got disqualified for two nights and I was so devastated that I got disqualified. The following Monday, I phoned him and I told him I was sorry. I went to his house, talked to him for about a half an hour. Now we're really, really good friends. So since 19, June 5th, 1987, we have not missed a race and we have 875 consecutive nights. So I think that's, I know, I'm pretty sure that's a Canadian record, but the NASCAR record is 798. So we beat them. And throughout that time, Thank you very much. Throughout that time, we have uh, 260 total checkered flags, 40 feature wins. And out of the 40 feature wins, I won 19 of them after I turned 50. So that was pretty cool for older people to think that you can still do good and still be competitive in your sport. In 1974, Quaker State joined me. Actually, I, I, I asked them to help me and they sponsored me in 1974. And the sponsorship was really good. It was oil product for 20 years. And then in 1993, they gave me uh, my first little bit of money. And then as time went on, I, next thing I had 20 years with them and then 30 years with them. And then next thing in 2013, I'm celebrating my 40th year with Quaker State. So at that, that time, it was the longest driver-sponsored partnership in racing history. And the only one that was close to us was Kenny Bernstein, the funny car racer who was with Budweiser for 33 years. So now, this year, 2023, Quaker State and I are going to celebrate our 50th anniversary. It's the longest driver-sponsored relationship on the planet. Thank you very much. So when people go through, I don't, I don't I win a lot. Like, I, I, I've done well. And it's hard now at my age to to win anymore because I'm racing against 20 year olds and 25 year olds and I'm 75 and I'll be 76 in April, but I'm still gonna race against them because there's no rule how old you are, how long you can race, as long as I don't get in, in, into trouble with them. And I don't, I, I respect racing because I love racing. But um, 
When our team, when we would be in the pits after a race and people would walk by our trailer and they'd say, they would see we were high-fiving each other and we were so excited and they'd say, did they win? I said, no, they didn't win, they finished fourth. Well, why are they acting like that for? Well, the reason why is because we started 23rd in the race and we finished fourth and we were high-fiving each other because that's what racing is. People ask me, they say, Do you, are you gonna win tonight? And I said, well, I don't know if I'm gonna win, but I know one thing, I'm gonna race and that's what I wanna do and that's what I love doing is racing. So when we can pass 20 cars in a race, that's pretty cool. You don't have to hold the checkered flag to count the victories that you get during a race and if you didn't smash up your car as well. Thank you. So racing, stock car racing, especially oval racing, I love, I love road, court racing, road course racing, and I, I do enjoy all the different venues that we've seen of racing here. Stock car racing is just my favorite, as it always has been. But it, it has many aspects, side-by-side -side racing with competitors, holding the checkered flag, finishing on, on the back of a leader, and, then, and you chased him for 20 laps, and you didn't hit him, and you didn't spin him out, and then hearing him at the end of the race being interviewed saying that he was happy that Gary Elliott was on my tail because I knew he wouldn't wreck me. So that was pretty cool. But then there's other nights whenever you're racing and you get towed off on a flatbed. And that's whenever your crew comes in handy because then on Monday, you're gonna be working on the car. But instead of one night a week working on the car, you're gonna be working on the car four nights a week to get it ready for the next week. And then why? Because you don't wanna miss the night. And other aspects of racing is also doing shows for sponsors. I love doing shows. I go and do all kinds of shows every year. Quaker State asked me once, they said, we don't really care too much about whether you win a championship or not, but we want to know what you'll do off the track. They said, would you do like six to eight uh, events off the track? I said, yeah, because I'm already doing 15, <laughs> so I'll do eight for sure. I also appreciate the people that do interviews and podcasts, RTR, racing, uh, I, I, I appreciate all the people that, that pr promote our sport and racing. And there was one fellow here earlier, help me with him, what's his name? Because he actually talked about me in 1987 and I know I just can't think of his name. Help me. Sure. You must, somebody must have been paying attention. Raceline, radio. Eric Thomas. There you go, say that again. <laughs> Eric Thomas, so in 1987, I was going to Florida to race in a luxury demolition derby, not a luxury enduro race, and Eric gave me a lot of publicity, and I really thank, thank him for doing that, and he's really good for our sport. Thank you, everyone, for being part of this journey here tonight for me. Thank you for Dan for nominating me. Thank you for the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame for inducting me in this year. I thank God for letting this, this happen to me. I could talk for another five minutes, but I'd have to use up a bit of your time, and I don't know if I can do that. But I thank you very much for this, and God bless you all. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Gary. Thanks. Our next inductee is a competitor, a builder, and a definitely a contributor as well. Our next inductee has been a fixture in the Canadian rally community for the past 60 years in the driving, significant contributor and builder categories. Terry Epp started his involvement with rallying as a co-driver in the 1960s. He and his driving partners would compete across Canada. In 1986, he would win the prestigious Deke Trophy celebrating his co-driving achievements. Terry would also race competitively with his wife, Linda. Away from the driver's seat, he was the CASC Ontario Region Rally Director in 1991, where he negotiated an amicable split from CASC. He became the founding president of the Canadian Association of Rally Sport, or CARS, and gained affiliation with ASN FIA Canada. Epp served as Canada's representative to the FIA for rallying and solo for 30 years and made several improvements to rally racing in the country. He drafted a five-year plan that included the standardization of rules and scoring, a unified event standard for national rallies and improved safety standards. He also helped bring rallying to national television, in English on TSN and in French on RDX. Epp has been the series manager of the Canadian Rally Championship since 2010. His involvement with the Canadian Rally organized body helped solidify rally racing for generations. 
now retired, the Stouffville, Ontario resident now enjoys watching a rich, healthy Canadian rally series, one which he helped build over the last 60 years. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome into the 2022 class of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, Terry Epp. Joining Terry for the presentation is Lawrence Partington. Thank you, Lawrence, for being here, not only as my presenter, but also as the person who spearheaded my being inducted into the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame. It was a very big honour for me, as well as Linda, my wife, our three sons, Bryn, Dwayne, Kyle, their spouses, and my seven grandchildren, our siblings, and their families. I'd also like to thank the many unexpected guests that are here today who to, came from distances from Subaru Canada and Quebec to be here tonight to see this happen. Uh, I was shocked at, at the numbers. Thank you all. Looking back now, I was born a motorhead. As a child, I knew every make and every year and it set me on a path that has lasted 55 years of active participation in motorsport. Covering five and a half decades in five minutes is... But here's my attempt. As soon as I finished teacher's college and started teaching, I bought a one-year-old Mustang and threw a display at the 1967 Royal Winter Fair I entered the rally world in a navigational rally for beginners. Soon I was caught in the sport, and I was entering events, joined Maple Leaf Rally Club, and a few years later was president of the club. I, met, I then met Linda in 1969 at York University as a result of her looking for a ride back and forth. One thing after another, we started the date and our second date was a checkpoint on a rally. And I thought, hmm, maybe there's something. We married in August of 1971, and ever since, she has been a partner in every single thing that we have done. I became the Ontario Region Rally Director, a position on the uh, CASCOR board, which I held for 10 years. We also organized the team rally for Maple Leaf Rally Club and competed in other events. We had good placings and won some others. After our children arrived, I became active in national championship rallies as well as the Ontario Navigational Championship. As a competitor, I went with different drivers and had a lot of success. And by the end of my competitive years, had won a Canadian Rally Championship in 1986. As the region director, I helped lead the way into stage rallies. At first, it was by selectives and transits. There were many rule changes and safety requirements imposed for vehicles and competitors, roll bars, and later cages, for example. They were often not liked by some of the competitors. In the meantime, regular navigational rallies continued. Somewhere in there, I became the National Rally Director and part of the CASC Board, Canadian Automobile Sports Clubs, with Roger Parrott as President. As we heard earlier, saw earlier, Roger passed away earlier this month. Um, I was very close with him uh, and his wife, and 
He's a member, a fellow member of this organization. We have lost a friend and a giant in the Canadian motorsport history. Going on. When the 19, 1993 FIA Canadian Formula One Brewery War began, I saw where it was going and that it might result in the possible demise of the national ruling body CASC. I worried that Rally was not in a position to survive as five separate regional pieces, and I felt that the Canadian Rally Championship, running since 1957, was also in jeopardy. It was Linda who said, then we should create a new national incorporated body outside of the FIA. It was she who did all the work to create CARS, the Canadian Association of Rally Sport, and it made it happen. In 2006, Linda and I organized a big celebration for the Canadian Rally Championship's 50th anniversary. Over the history of CARS, we moved the series to a full stage format using many of the FIA's safety standards and form formats, including reconnaissance and note notes. The five regions continue to have regional performance events, as well as navigational rallies, rally cross, and rally sprint events. I was president of CARS for about 10 years before others took on the role. However, I continued as the national series manager. While there were a few times in the sports history that film and TV played a part, it was not continuous. I felt we needed TV exposure, and I approached Lawrence with the idea of filming the series for TSN and RDS. It took a while for him to see the possibilities, but he did see it, and he made it happen. By using the TV package, I was able to bring both Subaru Canada and Yokohama on board as sponsors. Subaru is still a sponsor. It has been a continuing success. In fact, it matches that number. 30 years in television. I don't know of any other Canadian motorsport series that has been able to do that. A few years after ASN was formed, when the other one had failed, Roger approached cars, because we had separated, or well, there was no body, so we were on our own. Approached cars, and we worked out an agreement that brought Bot Rally back into the FIA family. And a little while later, I became an ASN director. And I continued that role, even though ASN is dormant at this time. Coming to the present, both Linda and I, national scorer, record keeper, and former CARS office manager, and I retired from CARS at the end of 2022. In conclusion, yes, my time at times in motorsport was hard work, but mostly a rewarding, very rewarding passion. It was the thousands of people who were or are in the sport organizers, their committees, marshals, workers, competitors, service crews, sweep, stewards, radio operators, sponsors, TV crews, and cars directors who I got to know that fed that passion. And finally, I will remember, also remember the joy and the insatisfaction competitors demonstrated when I congratulated them at the finish of each national rally. Thank you. Thank you, Terry. Our next uh, inductee is a competitor, builder, and significant contributor. Our next inductee checks all the boxes in the motorsport builder and significant contributor categories.
This proud Newfoundlander caught the motorsport bug first behind the wheel in the 1950s. Where Robert Ganu's accomplishments flourish, though, is behind the scenes of the East Coast Rally and Road Racing Series. He joined the St. John's Motor Club in 1958, where he began organizing rally, solo, and hill climb events in 1962. He brought the club into the CASC ranks and negotiated with the U.S. Embassy in Newfoundland to use two of their properties for events, including runways at Naval Station Argentia, where he eventually brought the Molly Slip Endurance Series. In 1972, he helped raise the funds to build Atlantic Motorsport Park. Ganu has held various roles with CASC over the years, including Race Director Atlantic Region and Assistant National Race Director. In 2002, he organized the first Targa Newfoundland and worked with others to develop 30 event operating manuals. In 2010, he worked with Janet Brink to create a safety protocol that made Targa Newfoundland the safest of the three main Targa events, with incident rates being reduced from 17% to 1.5%. In 2017, he created Targa Bambina, a three-day Taste of Targa event to attract local competitors. Please welcome into the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, Robert Ganu. Joining Robert as presenter is John Hume. Laurie Tunner, Jesus, this is some evening. <laughs> I know you ain't seen much of this before. Not around where I come from. Anyway, I had this speech written, translated from Newfoundlandese to Canadianism, so you'd understand. <laughs> so let's just start at the beginning, I guess. Good evening, and thank you to everyone behind this terrific evening. Peter. Your people are marvelous. It's truly an honor to be here. And while the honor has a name on it, I guess I really have to accept it on behalf of, and listen to the numbers, 40 core volunteers who have given their time over the past 20 years to organize and manage Target Newfoundland. And on behalf of the 120 Newfoundland communities and their 600 plus volunteers who annually host the event, and have safely run more than 900 Targa stages. These people are the heart and soul of Targa Newfoundland and their magic. Together, they've created a safe, exciting, accessible adventure unique to North American motorsports. To achieve that, believe it or not, the event has drawn on the experience of the airline industry, offshore exploration, motorsports, and insurance companies. The Targa volunteers have created a safety record that makes us all proud. As you saw in the introduction, we've lowered our incident rate for, dramatically because I, a long time ago I discovered when I raced, there were three stages of happiness. One, when you drove your car onto the trailer at the end of the weekend. Less happy when you pushed it on, and it was terrible when you lifted it on. Target teams even now are working diligently to ensure that the reintroduction of the event in 2023 happens and we're halfway to our entry requirements. So I'm terribly pleased about that for September 14th to 22nd. Anyone who's not busy, see me after. And this year we're looking into a future for the first time we've created the Electric Hybrid Challenge. Have a look at our website and you'll see what we're doing. And now there's so many people to thank. It's hard to know where to start, but let's start from the beginning. To Doug Meffham and Jim Kenzie for introducing the Targa concept. I still wonder if I'm thankful about that. <laughs> and to Doug for sticking around to see the concept through to reality. He, in actual, in actual fact, is my high priest of Targa. <laughs> to my friend John Hume, for his continuing belief in both the event and in me, and for reminding me when the emperor has forgotten his clothes. 
To my son Scott, his wife Judy, and my grandson Jack, who've traveled this journey with me and came here to celebrate the achievement tonight. Thanks, guys. Lastly, and most importantly, to May Sue, my partner and best friend, who, never having heard of motorsports 10 years ago, dove head, head first into the deep end to become a sage advisor, reluctant course setter, and my chief fan. All that in my common sense boss and, boss and fiscal decision partner. You know, a half, a half a century of motorsports involvement gives you some perspective. The achievement that I'm most proud of, though, is one of many years ago in 2006, and I think it was, it was just instrumental to Canada. The achievement was when Alistair Robinson, who's a rallyist, and I went before the Senate Standing Committee in 2006 to speak on behalf of motorsport in Canada that involved racing on public roads. You'll remember Bill C-19 would make racing on public roads a criminal offense. And we quickly realized, along with uh, Charlie Johnson of, of Molson's, that it will put the Canadian Formula One event, the Toronto Indy, Three Rivers, Targa, stage rallies, all at risk. After meeting with the Senate in committee, we succeeded in having an exemption for all rally sport written into Canadian law. And I quote the words of Senator ba Senators Baker and Milne from Hansard. You have done a great duty for racing. If you did not do this, I, would, I do not believe you would have been protected. You would have ended up in court at some point, and then determination would have been made based on provincial legislation, because this federal bill does not contain any definition that would protect you. Senator Mil Milne said, if it's any consolation to you, in addition to what Senator Baker say, and I say I support it, because he is absolutely right, there has to be an exemption. As a result, our street racing events were protected, and believe it or not, Targa Newfoundland, by name, is enshrined in the Canada law as an example of this. But today, I'm deeply concerned about something else, about the state of our sport in Canada. The rush to support the professional side of the sport is eclipsing the need to support and nurture the, the, the amateur side. Without the foundation of amateur motorsport, there will be nothing to sustain the, provi the, the provi provincial and, and professional events. No marshals, no crews, no next generation, no drivers, no future members of the Hall of Fame, and no Canadian sports worth of that name. We need to fix this, and we need to fix it quickly. We need to set up a pyramid where young kids can be introduced into support. I spent last Monday at Centennial College touring the place, and they come to Targa Newfoundland every year in support of the teams there. So we need to set up things like this where young kids can come in, regardless of what their income is or anything else, into the sport and be guided through the sport and through, from go-karting to whatever formula or whatever choice or sedans they choose. And I believe that this Hall of Fame and everyone in this room has a role to play in fixing that. And I hope you'll all join me with that effort. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you, Robert. Our next inductee is also a builder, significant contributor, contributor and uh, definitely a big competitor. next inductee started his racing career at the Edmonton International Speedway drag racing in the 1970s. Carl Haar would then move on to win multiple slalom and rally events run by the Northern Alberta Sports Car Club in the 1980s. He joined the Players GM Challenge Series in 1986 running full-time until 1992. The Sherwood Park Alberta native then shifted to stock car racing from 1994 to 2010. He started 80 races between the Cascar Super Series, Cascar West, Cascar East, and the NASCAR Pinty Series since 1998, recording 32 top five finishes, four Cascar West wins, and a Cascar West championship during that span. Har's two-car team effort was the anchor to the Cascar West racing program. He would then focus his efforts on the Winston West k and NASCAR Series. His Alberta-based team would make 78 starts between 2001 and 2014. Carl was also the team owner of his son Darrell's efforts in the NASCAR West division. 
The team's racing was a full family effort with his daughter Carrie helping with the day-to-day -day operations. He founded the Edmonton Corvette Club in 1979 and has spent one season each as a team owner in the NASCAR Xfinity Series and the Pirelli World Challenge. He's one of the most successful racers ever to come out of the province of Alberta. Please welcome to the 2022 class of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, the pilot of the number two Westworld Computer Chevrolet, Carl Parr. Joining Carl on stage as presenter is Daryl Har. <laughs> you did it! <laughs> Not yet. Not yet. Don't mess it up. <laughs> Little bit earlier, Daryl said the words to me every time before I went out to qualify against them. Don't F it up. <laughs> you know, one thing about, about racing out of Alberta, you don't have a lot of tracks that are close to home, and we, we spend a lot of time uh, on the road. Uh, our shops in Alberta, we built uh, our NASCARs that ran in the, in the U.S. and, uh, and we, we serviced them in Alberta. So we, we had to drag them all the way back. We had two semis going up and down the highway. And sometimes it just got to be, uh, to be almost impossible. Uh, and I remember one time we, uh, we had a bunch of races that were back to back and we were on the road for, uh, for four or five weeks and just didn't go home. You're paying with everything with your credit card, and anybody who's paid with your credit card racing knows what I mean. Um, you're running up thousands of dollars worth of bills. And that all went fine. Uh, after about four or five weeks, we got home, and I said to my, my first wife, Gail, I, <clears throat> I said, uh, why don't we go out and have dinner and a movie? I haven't uh, been around. Now, the next morning, I got a phone call from Visa saying they had noticed some unusual activity on my card. I'd spent tens of thousands of dollars. I bought my wife dinner and a movie. It was unusual activity. <laughs> Listen to everybody tonight uh, talk and, and, and stuff. I remember Gail when I phoned her and I said, Gail, I'm being indicted <laughs> in, in Toronto. And I think if I better understood the words indicted from inducted, she might be here tonight. <laughs> Anyways, I've still got my first race car, and, and I said my first wife um, a moment ago. I still have my first wife, too. Uh, a buddy of mine just said to me, well, that's unusual to have your first wife in your first race car. I said, no, I know lots of people that have their first car. <laughs> In addition to my wife, you know, I missed a lot of years and, and time with my daughter uh, on the road, but you saw in the video, anytime she could, she got on a plane, came down and helped us at the racetrack. And, and of course, Daryl, a reporter once asked me, he said, Carl, you're, you're doing better. You know, you're running a two-car team now. Daryl had come up through go-karts and got into Cass car with us. And uh, he said, what, what improved your driving? I said, the day Daryl passed me. So <laughs> I you know, run the same equipment. The kid was faster than me. Um, but you know, sta standing up here, race drivers are, are like quarterbacks on a football team. They're getting all the coverage. They're getting all the, the recognition. And, and one of the biggest things that I enjoyed over the years was, was bringing people in Edmonton into my shop and teaching them about race cars, how to build shocks, what stagger meant, what cross weight means. Um, they just had an interest, and the gentleman before me talked about wanting to develop that. And, and 
you know, I'm so happy at, at some, of the, some of the results. One of my guys, he's now working for Dale Earnhardt full time in the, in the States. And, and there's lots of guys who've gone on to support minor racing. And these are all volunteers, people who come out and, and help us, some for very small pay. So I want to take a few minutes and just recognize some people who have been with me uh, helping for, for some over 40 years. Uh, Rudy Reck, he has uh, driven my transporters. He has been my spotter at the track. And when he didn't spot right and we wrecked, he helped me fix the car at the shop. <laughs> Todd Nickel, same thing. He's been around for 40 years since we started Corvette clubs together and rally raced uh, Corvettes and slalom raced. Uh, has always had our back, always been there when we needed him, and, and he's here tonight. Thank you very much, Todd. There's a lot of crew. Um, some names you might recognize, you probably won't, but it's important I mention their names from Canada. Steve Yakumchuk, Jeff Wernham, Chris Sager, Kevin Hine, Ian Woodger, Shane McCabe, Dusty O'Connell, and Earl Wong. I want to thank all of you guys for, for me being here and representing you. And from our California team, Renee, Bernie, Brandon, Amanda, Mike, Marvin, James, and Charlotte, thanks so much for, for all of your help over the years. And, and in closing, I just want to thank the committee and everybody else who is being indicted tonight. <laughs> Congratulations, Carl. Thanks, Carl. Our next inductee, once again a builder, contributor, and a competitor. Our next inductee may be small in stature, but has stood tall in the Canadian motorcycle and racing scene for the past 60 years. Dave Lloyd finished runner-up in his first race in the Canadian Junior Championship at Harewood Acres and was soon promoted directly from junior to expert class by the Canadian Motorcycle Association. He progressed through the ranks and made his FIM World Championship debut in 1965. If it had two wheels, Lloyd raced it. From road racing to motocross to endurance to ice racing to sidecars, Dave Lloyd has tried his luck. The Southwestern Ontario racer soon focused his efforts on motorcycle road racing. From 1966 to 1968, Lloyd raced across Europe against world champions and the stars of the day in locations ranging from England and Isle of Man to the Netherlands and Czechoslovakia. He had several midfield finishes in Europe and won a bronze TT replica trophy and silver TT replica trophy during that time. At the age of 48, Lloyd returned to the Isle of Man to race once more on a Suzuki 750cc production bike. Lloyd then returned to Canada and rode in various disciplines in the 1970s. He made land speed record attempts in 2009 and 2011 and competed in the VRRA period one 350cc class championship in 2021, winning the class title at 81 years old. While in his 70s, the two-wheeled daredevil joined North American sidecar champion Dave Powell on a vintage sidecar run. Lloyd was part of the organization group that helped Cascar become a force in the 1990s. He was also involved in the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame and the Canadian Motorcycle Hall of Fame organizations. To this day, you can still find him tinkering or turning laps on a vintage motorbike. Please welcome to the 2022 class of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, Dave Lloyd. Joining Dave Lloyd as a presenter is Herb Becker. I also want to mention uh, Tony and Linda Novotny wanted to be here tonight, but Dave, send their absolute best to you and congratulations. Good evening. 
I have to change, <coughs> change gears here. <coughs> Different pair of glasses. <laughs> Please be seated. <laughs> Thank you, Todd. <coughs> Just uh, one minor correction. My presenter is my uh, <coughs> good friend, Fran Hall from Fraser, Michigan, and uh, if you've seen the movie Ford versus Ferrari, you'll know, <clears throat> you should know that Fran built and provided the cars for that movie. <clears throat> Those fabulous looking GT40s, <clears throat> Porsches, and D-type Jags that helped make the movie the success it was. Thank you, Peter, for a very welcome phone call informing me of my induction. A big thank you also uh, to the uh, selection committee for the support of my nomination. I also congratulate my fellow nominees <clears throat> I'm honored to be included not only in your ranks, but with the honorable, honorable members previously inducted, many of them good friends and fellow competitors. If I were to thank everyone who has shown me a kindness or given me a helping hand in my racing career, they would be serving breakfast in the lobby and I would still miss a few. I don't want to do that, <clears throat> but I do thank them individually and collectively. None of us do this alone. If I were to apologize for errors and omissions, it would take considerably longer. I may not be the luckiest man alive, but I'm surely one of them <clears throat> for many reasons the most important of which are with me here this evening. But on reflection of what I would say this evening, given my <clears throat> long involvement with motorsport, I've realized that while I'm proud of my accomplishments and that race results do matter, what is really important and sustaining is the number of incredible people I have met along the way throughout Canada, the United States, England, Europe, and other parts of the world. This has resulted in enduring friendships that have lasted for decades. The most motorsport community has, in fact, been my extended family for most of my adult life and has contributed to and continues to contribute, contribute to making my life truly rich and rewarding. Sharing a racing experience or two, it is only a six lap race, just six laps. But the race distance is 226 miles or 364 kilometers. Each lap being 37 and three quarter miles or 61 kilometers in length. There are some 219 turns, and these races are held on public roads with curbs, manhole covers, telephone poles, trees, stone walls, houses, etc., all lining the course. The elevations range from sea level to almost 1,400 feet. It's really a case of being in the right place at the right time, all of the time. Hitting the bottom of Bray Hill just after the start of the race at well over 100 miles an hour, the suspension bottoms out, tires flatten, and the G-forces compress you into the bike until you are shot out as if from a cannon back uphill on the other side. There are some 100 riders in the event, each leaving the start line in pairs at 10 second intervals. As a privateer, that is a non-factory supported rider, you know you're not going to win. Your main objective is first being firstly to finish and hopefully 
within a specified time of the winner, potentially winning a silver or bronze replica of the race winner's trophy and the respect of your fellow competitors. These are the world famous Isle of Man TT races in which I competed several times. Representing Canada on the World Championship Motorcycle Grand Prix circuit in the mid to late 60s was a highlight of my racing career. These were the days of epic battles between the Japanese Honda, Yamaha, Suzuki, and Italian MV Augusta factories, all competing with high revving, exotic multi-cylinder machines with open megaphones. Under full battle conditions, these race bikes sounded more like jet fighter aircraft than motorcycles. These races would, would routinely attract massive crowds numbering literally in the hundreds of thousands. If you recall, the 60s were just a few short years after the Second World War, and people were hungry for entertainment, and very few people had much money to spend. So when the races came to town, they drew the crowds in 100, 200, 300,000 in total numbers. Most of the racing was again on public roads, hence the name road racing, on circuits such as Frankerschamp in Belgium, Bruno in Czechoslovakia, and Sachsenring in East Germany. At one time or another, most, if not all, of the Formula One and Motorcycle Grand Prix champions of the past have competed on these historic circuits. Again, as a privateer competing against factory teams, it was not a level, level playing field. Your best hope was to get a good mid midfield finish, possibly top 10, and perhaps get noticed by a factory team or top sponsor. Like all racers, or I should say like all old racers, it seems that the older I get, the faster I was. <laughs> But my most recent challenge on wheels, <clears throat> excuse me, is trying to stay upright on a set of rollerblades with my granddaughter, Evelyn. Not, <laughs> not looking good for me. <clears throat> excuse me. But evidently somewhat entertaining, and I'm sure someone has 911 on speed dial. By the way, Evelyn says I'm being deducted tonight. <laughs> as, I, as I said earlier, I may not be the luckiest man alive, but I am certainly one of them. Receiving this honor this evening and being able to share this celebration with my family and friends is yet another once-in-a-lifetime experience. And I thank the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame and all of you for making this possible. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Congratulations, Dave. The next inductee is a significant contributor, builder, and a competitor. Our next inductee comes from a very strong stock car racing bloodline. Derek Lynch started his career racing karts in Eastern Ontario at Indian River in Peterborough, where he won four championships. In 1986, at only 14 years of age, he made the jump to late model sportsman racing at Peterborough Speedway, where he won five features and the track championship in 1987. The Southern Ontario late model standout would go on to win the McCurley Millen Classic at Cayuga Speedway in 1988 while winning multiple features at Peterborough Speedway. Lynch raced in the ACT Pro Stock late model series from 1988 to 1995, where he recorded a pair of top five finishes and three wins, including a victory in the prestigious Oxford 250. That big Oxford 250 win secured him a date with promoter Tom Curley's daughter, Kate, and they would go on to marry. In 1994, Lynch became the ACT Regional Series Champion, along with the Performance Racing News Stock Car Racer of the Year Award. From 1995 to 2000, Lynch was the most successful Canadian to run in the NASCAR Bush Grand National North Tour. 
Away from the driver's seat, he's worked as a fabricator for NASCAR Cup Series and NASCAR Truck Series teams in the late 1990s, including Daryl Waltrip Motorsports and Bobby Allison Motorsports. Lynch raced in a variety of late model series over the last two decades. He made 30 starts in the NASCAR Pinty Series between 2007 and 2016, winning at Cayuga Speedway in 2007. He's also worked as a manager and promoter of Kawartha Speedway from 2004 to 2012. To this day, he builds and maintains race cars for local drivers in Eastern Ontario. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome into the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, Derek Lynch. kind of like Dave, but I've got to pull my first pair of glasses out, so. First and foremost, I'd like to uh, thank the Canadian Motorsports Hall of Fame. I, uh, I've always considered myself uh, a great historian of the sport uh, and definitely a student. And uh, to be included in this group um, tonight and the group that came before me uh, is an incredible honor. Uh, it's really, when I got the call from Peter, it was, it was quite humbling to say the least. Um, my family, we run a portable toilet business. And uh, so needless to say, I was out cleaning toilets. And, and Kate called me and she said, have you answered your phone? And I said, no, I, I haven't looked at it. And I looked at it and I knew I recognized the name, but I couldn't figure out where from. And then uh, I had that call from Peter and needless to say, it certainly changed my day from sucking to a lot better after that. So uh, it was, uh, I thank you for that, Peter. Um, congratulations to all my uh, fellow inductees tonight. Uh, I, I'm sure you feel the very same way. It's just an incredible honor and we sat here earlier and watched that list of names go up and down the screen and uh, to be included, like I said, with that group uh, is, is unbelievable. So uh, again, congrats to all those as well. I had some wonderful people. Uh, my wife uh, did most of the legwork on this um, and, and kept it a secret from me throughout the whole thing. So after it came to light, uh, I realized that, you know, there was people who had um, contributed on my behalf, uh, recommendations, and I, I would like to, to recognize them. You'll, I think, recognize a lot of these names, but it was quite an honor in itself to have those people uh, speak or write on my behalf. Uh, Stan Meserve, um, great stock car racer from the Northeast, uh, fabricator and uh, crew member in the NASCAR Cup Series and actually competed in the NASCAR Winston Cup Series back in the late 60s, early 70s. Robbie Crouch, uh, a standout late model racer uh, in New England uh, and through Canada and Eastern uh, Canada as well. Um, Chaz Howe, uh, owner, second generation owner of Howe Racing Enterprises in Michigan. Eric Thomas, uh, who needs no introduction in uh, area media and r Canadian racing media. Uh, Dave Moody, uh, who again probably needs no introduction in media and motorsports. Greg McPherson uh, from Inside Track. Um, and Kevin LePage, a uh, competitor that I raced against uh, years ago with the Axe Series. So to know that those guys uh, spoke and, and wrote on my behalf, like I said, was, was an incredible honor. And I was very proud of that. Had nothing happened here, had Kate showed me those letters, and to realize that they thought that of me um, was accomplishment enough in, in my racing. So, uh, like I said, a, a very flattering. Uh, gesture. I've got some great people that have helped me over the years for, um, since I started. Uh, I started uh, racing in 81 when I was 10 and we got laughing. I'm 52 this year so for 41 of those years or 42 of those years I've, I've raced something and tried to compete at least once a year somewhere and or was involved at, at the, as they mentioned, the level of promotion or something like that. And as we had dinner tonight, um, again it, it's, I, I've got people that are here tonight that have been there for the entire time. Um, I have a couple competitors that I've raced against that are here uh, and people that were there from day one. Uh, and again, that's something I'm, I'm very proud of and I, I thank those folks for coming. I've lost a couple people uh, in the last couple years that were big supporters of my racing and I'd like to mention them. Uh, Jerry Hasek, Jerry Hicks, 
Larry Crow Sr. and Skip Ambrose that owned Kawartha Speedway when I was there as a promoter. Uh, they were very, and also owned the NASCAR Canadian Tire uh, Series team at the time that we raced. They were very big influences uh, and supporters, and I'd be remiss not to, uh, not to mention them. I started my career, as I indicated, uh, in the early 80s, and I come from a racing family. So, again, I've been very blessed in the fact that I had so much support as I come up. My dad, as one of the pitchers indicated, started racing in 1967. Um, so. It doesn't matter what industry, sport, business you're in, when you can springboard off of the support, the knowledge, and, and the mistakes of the people that come before you, uh, it certainly makes your task a, a lot easier. So not only did I have my dad's experience, but I also had the experience of all the people that helped him that springboarded my career until uh, the folks that are here tonight that were my generation came along to help me uh, fulfill the rest of the, the distance along the way. So uh, I'm, I, like I said, I thank those guys as well. I would like to use this platform to thank some people that I don't think get enough recognition, um, and they've been a huge part of my involvement in motorsports for the last 40 years. And when I look at the state of racing, and I think it's very good, I think it's healthy, I think it's getting better, I agreed with somebody else's comments that we need to do, I think it was Mr. Apps, we need to do more at the local level to continue to, to bolster that. But I'm, I'm just going to read some names, and I'd like a round of applause for them because I think they kind of get shuffled uh, under the rug a little bit. Um, Eric Thomas, Bruce Mellenbacher, and John Massenburg, uh, they were incredible contributors getting our sport into the mainstream through the 80s and 90s. Jim and Joel Robinson, Greg McPherson, uh, Dean McNulty, Norris McDonald, uh, and Joe Chisholm. I'd like a round of applause for those people. They do a lot of work on our behalf to keep our sport rolling. I want to say a special thanks to my mom and dad, Dave and Linda, they're here tonight, my sister Jennifer. Um, they made incredible sacrifices, as we can all attest to, not only time, but financially. Uh, racing, there's nothing cheap about racing, it's the age old story, you want to make a fortune racing you know, start with a big one, you end up with a small one. So uh, it's pretty easy. But uh, like I said, uh, they, just the time alone, the travel, um, I've probably got a lot of people here that can tell you the exact amount of mileage or hours it takes to get from Norwood, Ontario to Unity, Maine several times a summer. And it, it's a long way, I'll tell you. So um, like I said, my parents were a big part of that. Um, I'd also like to thank, it's, it's quite a thing to stand here and every great memory in your life is sitting in row G and H. I, yeah, I've got 28 people here tonight supporting me, and I can't think of a laugh, a story, a race uh, that one of those people weren't involved in. Uh, so I thank you guys very much for being here. Uh, it means a lot, and uh, I'm looking forward to having a good time afterwards. Finally, I have to thank my wife, Kate. Um, she's been a huge supporter for me over the last 22 years, coming up on 23. Um, she was an integral part of our time at Kawartha Speedway. Uh, we couldn't have done that without her and, and her background in the sport. Um, she understands, she grew up in the sport, so she understands the time and the commitment. Uh, my daughter Lila, I wanted to race long enough so that she got a picture in victory lane. Uh, I was able to accomplish that, so all the pressure's off now. Uh, but thank you to you both very much. I, I couldn't do it without you. Thanks to everyone for coming tonight. This is an incredible honor, and uh, I look forward to catching up with everyone after. Thank you. Congratulations, Derek. Don't forget that. Thank you. <laughs> Our next inductee is a significant contributor and a builder to the sport. Our next inductee is a significant contributor and builder within the Canadian motorsport community. Bob McDonald competed in multiple Ontario Regional Road Racing Series and the Firestone Firehawk Endurance Championship, but his greatest achievement in motorsport came through his sales role at Sony of Canada. He was an integral part of the company's sponsorship of motorsport through race cars, billboards, print advertising and television where the Sony Handicam was used for in-car footage. Several notable drivers were supported by Sony of Canada in their racing efforts, including Robin Buck, Paul Tracy, Ron Fellows, Peter Lockhart, and Scott Maxwell, all Hall of Famers. 
McDonald worked to bring Sony sponsorship to the grassroots level as well through local karting clubs and annual events held by the Simcoe Kart Club. He served on multiple boards of directors at the grassroots level. He also worked directly with tracks and events to include Sony banners and product support at notable circuits, including the Toronto and Vancouver street courses and Canadian Tire Motorsport Park. Bob's 20 plus year commitment to the Canadian motorsport community during the 80s and 90s helped many young Canadian racers achieve their goals in what's called the golden age of racing. Please welcome to the 2022 class of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, Bob McDonald. That was my car upside down and I lent it to Bob. <laughs> hey Rob. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Someone earlier said, wow, and that's exactly my sentiment. I'd like to take the first minute of uh, my presentation to ask everyone to stand up and stretch their legs and <laughs> get some blood circulating in your buttocks. And I'm, my ass is killing me. <laughs> No, I'm not kidding. Stand up. You'll like it. Now, Bob, can we do this? Yeah. Start away. Yeah. Uh, I can't speak for the rest of the nominees, but when I was informed that by Peter, actually, that I'd be inducted into the Hall of Fame, there was a sort of cocktail of emotions. Uh, surprise, excitement, but uh, mostly uh, disbelief. You know, there, there had to be some kind of a mistake. Uh, I'm aware of who has come before me and what they've achieved. Like all of you, I have great respect for the current members of the Hall of Fame, including tonight's class. So by what crazy equation do I end up sharing a platform with these individuals? I'd love to say that I've had enough time before tonight to completely figure it out, but I, feel, I fear the full explanation may always elude me. With the help of my son Rob, I was able to rule out early that it was my prowess behind the wheel that caught anyone's attention. Although a third place trophy in the Grand Sport class from the regional bark race in 1990 may have you thinking differently. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here I pull out the trophy that's about the size of an iPhone and show you, but I forgot it at home. It sucks to be old. I want to thank first uh, Jim Duckworth and, uh, and my co-driver back in 1990 or thereabouts, Paul Mackey, for letting me fulfill a dream on the regional race circuit and in the Firehawk series with a retired player's GM car. It was Jim, who many in this room will know, that brought me and as a result Sony into Canadian motorsport. Jim introduced me to one of his friends and customers. <laughs> this guy, Peter Lockhart. Peter then connected me with John Powell. <laughs> Thank you for that. Yeah, thank you. Now, 
as you all know, there's no easier sell than a salesperson. And that's what I was at Sony of Canada, was a salesperson. So with Peter, Jim, and John pitching, I was sort of all ears. Through Powell Motorsport and Bob Johnson Chevrolet, Jim was giving, joining many other dealerships at the time and fielding cars in the Players GM series. Jim thought that I and Sony might, be, might like to be involved. And as a lifelong motorhead, uh, my curiosity was piqued. It was the mid-80s, and it wasn't going to be just a matter of getting the right people on so at Sony on board and writing a big check. There had to be a bit of a business case for Sony's involvement. And as, as we all remember, there, there was a lot of momentum behind that series. The you know, players had signed up, General Motors was in there, all but some big companies. Uh, but I, when I learned that the series was going to have a TV package, uh, and, and national television coverage, uh, that's when the wheels started turning. <laughs> no pun intended. Yes. No, I thought it was better than that. <laughs> told him it wasn't. <laughs> he told me it wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, before going any further, uh, it was a good idea, but even a, 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 if it was a seedling of a good idea, it would have gone nowhere without uh, the tremendous support that I got from a few individuals inside Sony. Uh, my boss at the time, Vice President of the Consumer Product Group, Marnix Van Gamer, luckily also a car guy and a motorsports fan, kind of agreed with it that, hey, this may be something good. Coincidentally, our, our Vice President of Advertising at the time, Communications and Advertising, Doug Willex, was in the middle of finalizing a multi-year deal to support the Molson Indies in Toronto and Vancouver. Both of these individuals were instrumental in the next steps and all the steps that uh, kept us involved with motor store, motorsports. Uh, in one way or another, until I received the copper handshake from Sony. <laughs> it just so happened that the, the kickoff of the player series coincided with a, a bit of a new era in personal electronics. We had Walkman coming out and all sorts of Discman, all sorts of miniature uh, electronics. And another, one product we had was a Sony Handicap. And we wanted to get the word out about this. Uh, and uh, the national television package seemed like it might be a too good an opportunity to pass out. Now, our, our goal wasn't to buy ad space on broadcast or to give the series a lump of money, uh, although that would come later, but rather add an angle to the broadcast by using the handicap as an in-car camera during the races. This was 1986, I guess, and there was nothing in the way of in-car video at that time, at least that I can remember. Uh, let's put the same handicam, any person could go into a store and buy into these race cars and showcase how good the video is, not to mention how tough the camera is. We'll put a handicam uh, logo up on the screen during the in-car footage, and we'll get a healthy ROI on what was initially an investment of only time and product. For Sony and myself personally, this was the beginning of a great relationship with uh, Motorsport. Rob, could you get me a drink of water? My water's down there. I got cotton mouth, the Mojaves. Thank you, Mr. Bai. Takes a village. All right. <laughs> what do you say? Takes a village. <laughs> That's cool. <laughs> Always nice to have your support. <laughs> <clears throat> For Sony and myself, this was the beginning of a great relationship with Canadian Motorsport. And it became clear early on that what started out as a sound business case for Sony had important benefits for the series teams 
and drivers. And not just the Powell Motorsport cars that we directly sponsored, the Bob Johnson cars with Jim Duckworth. Uh, and I suspect that perhaps this is one of the reasons why I'm standing up here tonight as a contributor to motorsport. As a racing dad myself, I know all too well about struggling to find sponsorship and trying to stay on track sort of thing. I also know that the sell is significantly easier when there's a tangible, demonstrable return to the person across the desk. When we put those handicams inside the race cars, all the drivers and team sponsors got a static image of their logo on the screen broadcast to a national audience. It was one thing to see the cars whiz by at speed and logos on the side as big as we could make them at the time. It was another to ride up the back straight at most sport, Canadian Tire Motorsport Park, and see Esso, Canadian Tire, Tide, Pringles, and Sony, of course, brightly displayed across the dash, dashboard roll bar or back windows, any visible surface. Not to mention, given how close the racing is, uh, the back bumper and rear window of the car in front were usually on screen for quite a period of time. This was an approach that could benefit all series and drivers and could lift the whole boat sort of thing. Our TV production companies, Lawrence Partington, Lawrence, I didn't get the chance to say hello to you earlier. Uh, and uh, Jim Robinson, who I know isn't in here, but Joel was involved at the time. Uh, they took full advantage of these, uh, of these shots. The various scrutineers at the series also wanted to take full advantage of these shots, but often when they came to, to us later and said, we want to see the tape from that car number 11, uh, and, and see what happened to that incident in corner nine. <laughs> Would you believe it? The... Yeah. The camera lived. Yeah. yeah, the camera was still working, by the way. <laughs> and uh, so, we, would you believe it? We, when we pressed the button, the thing didn't start. I don't know. <laughs> Well, that depended on whose tape they were looking for. Uh, the series drivers saw value in being able to easily demonstrate the power of national television to their sponsors' ROI. We soon had partnerships with the biggest racing events, including the Molson Indies in Toronto and Vancouver, and the Canadian Grand Prix in Montreal. One of my favorite, of course, was the uh, Simcoe Kart Club's annual Sony Grand Prix, which became a mar marquee karting event in the 90s. Our involvement grew to include print and television advertising, trackside signage, Harvey uh, made sure of that, uh, event program advertising, Etc. Additionally, we were able to pro provide some direct fun financial support to many up and coming drivers. People like Paul Tracy in the ARS Indy Light Series, the late Stefan Pru in F2000 and F uh, Formula Atlantic, and many, many more in the long list of showroom stock racing series that made it the golden era of motorsport. For me, personally, uh, motorsport became a family affair. Most weekends between Victoria Day and Labor Day were spent at one racetrack or another with my wife, my daughter Kristen, and my son. We only lasted four years on the sidelines before... Uh, that was just an uh, acknowledgement. <laughs> yeah. Uh, me in the aforementioned Camaro, 
third place trophy. Uh, and my son in go-karts, who incidentally later drove open wheel race cars for Chris Buy and AIM. I can't tell you guys how proud I am to be on this stage at the same night that you fellows have been inducted into this thing. It's pretty awesome, pretty awesome. Uh, I I think I speak for many in the room, and I obviously from the previous, some of the previous speeches, I know I am when I say that my motorsport memories are some of my fondest. And in reflecting in all those years, it's clear to me that it was as much about friendships and a shared bond as any action on the track. When I was putting these words together, a lot of names and memories came up. And in closing, I'd like to share a few of those names and hope that it will bring back some of your own memories of these folks, all of them great supporters of Canadian motorsport. Harvey Hudis, Brett Goodman, Enzo and Linda Chiavitti from the Simcoe Kart Club. Marty Chanel. Jim Martin. Earl uh, Dickinson, the Duke. Peter Lockhart. Robin Buck. Ron Fellows. Mike Hart. Ted Powell, John Powell, Bob Rio, Lawrence, I know you remember them, the Duckworth family, Jackie, Fran, Jim, and Paul, Chris and Kathy Vi, and Haley, Keith and Ian and all the people involved with AIM. Our time there was tremendous. Paul Mackey, Eric Thomas, and John Massingberg. Leslie McDonald. You and, and so many others here tonight are a huge part of what made those times so great. And that's what makes this induction into the Canadian Motorsports Hall of Fame so overwhelmingly special to me. Thank you to the board. Thank you, Peter. And thank all of you. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Rob. Our next inductee is in the competitor category. Our next inductee hails from British Columbia. He goes into the hall as a competitor and builder. Dick Midgley has primarily served as a mechanic, car builder, and car owner during his motorsport career. Early in that career, Midgley got behind the wheel of some of his race cars, and this is where he got the nickname, The Bird, after one of his runs saw his car get airborne. In 1958, he co-owned a car with his older brother in the Jalopy class at Western Speedway, where they won the track title in their very first season. Dick continued to field cars in local divisions into the 70s, where he expanded his efforts south of the border. More than 70 drivers competed for Midgley in the NASCAR West Series from 72 to 2014, including 2002 Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame inductee Roy Smith. Between 74 and 92, Midgley fielded cars in 26 NASCAR Cup Series races, where he made two Daytona 500 starts with Smith as the driver in 76 and 1977. Midgley also owned a NASCAR Craftsman truck, competing in the late 90s and early 2000s. 
He also ran cars in international events, including a third place finish with Dave Marcus in a NASCAR exhibition race at Australia's Calder Park Thunderdome in 1988, winning the NASCAR affiliated Australian Championship with Jim Richards in 1996. Midgley and Richards also competed in Japan at the Suzuka circuit. Midgley Motorsports has competed in five different countries, winning in four of them. Few Canadians have as much NASCAR experience. Please welcome into the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, Dick Midgley. Oh my God, there's so many people here. First thing I want to say is I noticed a lot of the um, recipients have been repetitious, and I totally agree with everything they say. They all want to give thanks to the committee that made all this possible. I know it's a lot of work. And um, let me think for a minute, because they, they, uh, I'll, I'll carry on with what I my notes I made up here. I got to tell you, it's more terrifying here than I would think. I've been watching this show lately, a trip down Highway 401. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll do my best. First of all, uh, I'd like to make special thanks to my people from home that uh, provided all the information, because they were a lot better at doing it than me. Over the years, I never had time to separate a lot. I had boxes and boxes of pictures, et cetera. Um, uh, Mike, Mc, Mike uh, McKenzie uh, was one of the helpers, or did a tremendous amount of work, and Normie Wilcox. Uh, without them, the, these people here just wouldn't have had enough information. Um, and obviously, over the years, uh, you've seen there in the video, so I don't need to name them again. Um, I've had a lot of good people around me uh, and made a lot of friends with those people that passed on a lot of good information, etc. There's, there's no one person in racing that can make it happen. You, you need all the other people supporting you. I mean, I have had so much good help over the years. And there are two others I'd like to mention. Um, Ken Emerson and Jim Sikowski from our hometown. Uh, they live roughly 30 miles up, up, up the island, and they were at my place. They all had jobs, of course, but they would work on the car every, once a week, every week, when just for maintenance, and if necessary, a whole lot more. So I do, I do want to mention them. Um, as they mentioned there, uh, you know, we've raced in five different countries. North Africa, we went there. The government had built a uh, trap for Formula One at just south of Johannesburg. Beautiful facility. And they never got the completed deal with um, F1. Apparently, it's quite difficult. And, and they still have hopes of doing it. But in conjunction to the road course, they built a beautiful oval. And uh, we went there, and there was a lot of good competition, and we won that race. Uh, my son-in-law, Brett, Brett here, he was the um, co uh, uh, chief on that uh, car, and he did a fantastic job and was part of that win. Um, so Brett is here tonight with my daughter, Lisa, and my wife, Judy. Um, I guess I should tell you a little history about that. Uh, I met Judy when I was uh, 17. I started working on race cars uh, at 16. It was a neighbor up the road that had a really good car, and I, I worked on that for one year, and then the following year went on my own. And we, they started a new series that was a lesser horsepower, 
Back in the day, I mean, all across North America, the, the most, a lot of the race, Saturday night racers were uh, 34 Fords, and that's what we were running back in the day, and then we progressed into the newer stuff. So I met uh, my wife, who has been uh, very supportive, has to be, I guess, with a race car man. Um, and uh, we uh, were an item, you know, uh, as from 17 years on, and went to high school together. And uh, when we got married, we had uh, two daughters. Um, my younger daughter is here tonight, and she has always been around the race car and active. And she quite often would co-drive when we, you know, had the one-ton trucks and triaxle trailers that travel all over the place. But she was a good driver and always supported us with racing. Uh, unfortunately, our oldest daughter, we lost her at a very young age. Well, no, I shouldn't say young, really young. She stayed home and uh, ran my marine business while I was away racing. And I, was a, I, w I did the Australian thing for about six months a year each year for roughly 10 years. And I used to go back and forth every two weeks. I mean, I had more air miles than a lot of pilots. I know at one time I was in, uh, it wouldn't happen today. I used to get upgraded all the time. I was up at the top of a 747, and a pilot come along and said, uh, Mr. Midgley, how would you like to come and sit in the big seat? And I said, yeah, that'd be great. This was before we took off. So I asked him on the way up there, I said, how come you picked me to get this privilege? He says, nobody travels as many miles as you do. He says, I'm not allowed to fly as often as you are. <laughs> so anyway, I mean, like I say, it wouldn't happen today. To give you an idea of, the, of realistically, without uh, over dwelling on it, uh, in, my total, in my, all my miles that I did on aircraft, it was phenomenal. I, I was involved in four emergency landings. A lot of pilots don't even experience that. They all turned out well, by the way. Um, so, uh, let's see what else can we talk about here. Um, you, you know, I was very fortunate. I had a lot of very experienced drivers, and I wasn't going to, in fact, it says right here to start with, I'm not going to mention any names because sure as heck I'm going to forget some, and, you know, that's a terrible thing. Um, but I'll, I'll tell you some of the drivers. I had um, uh, George Fulmer drove for me. Dave Marcus, Andy Houston, um, the, uh, Ron Hornaday. These are guys that were champions, NASCAR champions, like in the truck series, et cetera. Um, what was the uh, uh, Indy driver then? No, oh, George. George. Former. Former. Fulmer, yeah, George Fulmer. Sorry, George. <laughs> I'm terrible on names. I know I, we'll be at the ra racetrack lots of times, and my son-in-law, these guys would come along. It could be the world champion, and they, they would be talking to me, and I'd talk back to them, and my son-in-law would say, you didn't have a clue who that man was, do you? <laughs> I had to admit, no, I didn't, but I, I got good at it. So let's see what else can we tell you that's not a lie. Um, <laughs> that, that's pretty much it. I, I don't know. I, <laughs> I told you I'm not good at making speeches. <laughs> Thank you. That's okay. Yeah, excellent. We made it? Yeah, we'll do this way. Oh, okay. Thank you. There we are. <laughs> Thank you, Dick Midgley. One more inductee in the 2022 class, builder, significant contributor, and competitor. Our next inductee started his career in NHRA sportsman drag racing, competing in stock, super stock, and super gas between 1972 and 1980. He designed and built a full chassis Plymouth Arrow for NHRA Super Gas in 1977, which won a pair of awards at the International Car Show. In 1975, he opened a speed shop, which provided support for several cast car teams to begin racing on road courses in the 1990s. 
He then worked as an NHRA technical inspector in the 1980s before racing in the GT class of the Canadian Firestone Firehawk series in the early 1990s, winning Rookie of the Year honors in 1991. He continued road racing in various events until 1997. In the mid-1990s, he was the chief technical director for the North American Touring Car Series. In the later 1990s, he was team manager and fabricator for his son's racing efforts in the SCCA. In 2000, Spencer joined the Grand Am Series full-time, where he was responsible for the Coney Challenge Series technical department. Later, he worked with Hall of Famers Multimatic to introduce the Mustang into the Coney Challenge Series. He also worked with Grand Am and IMSA in leadership roles at the NASCAR Research and Development Center. Please welcome, in the competitor and builder category of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, Scott Spencer. Joining Scott as presenter is Bruce Mellenbacher. That's not what I was thinking. <laughs> well, a lot of stories tonight. Don't know if I can match any of them. Um, most of my motorsports career was done from the other side of the table, from the technical side, the sanctioning bodies, the rules, um, that kind of thing. Um, I did note tonight that there was many people here that my career touched on. Um, the AIM Motorsports guys, I was there when you came to Rolex. Um, the drag race guys, some of the cast car guys we did work for. There's a, a big crossover in this room with motorsports and a lot of people. <clears throat> Anyways, I want to congratulate everybody tonight on their indictment. <laughs> I'm nervous about leaving. <laughs> I'm also very humbled to be part of this group. Um, when I got the call from Peter, much like I think was Bob said, wasn't quite sure if it was a prank or what was happening. It took me a little bit of time to, to digest that, but nevertheless, I'm here um, and happy to be here. <clears throat> My whole life has been motorsports since I was too young to remember. Um, I started uh, drag racing. Uh, spent some time at Dragway Park, and I need to thank the Mellenbacher family for giving me the opportunity to work at Dragway Park, which um, led to a, a career at, at NHRA as a, as a technical inspector and an SFI chassis inspector. Um, it was the Mellenbacher family that opened that door for me. <coughs> um, I had the pleasure, I guess, of racing one of Ed Hamburger's stock eliminator cars. Ed was a uh, uh, very much a driving force in NHRA, and he taught me so much about uh, drag racing and NHRA, I have to thank him. Um, when I joined NHRA, uh, <laughs> the dark side, as some people say, um, it allowed me to hone my technical skills and allowed me to come become one of the first SFI certified chassis inspectors in North America. Um, I left NHRA in the 90s, and thanks to Tom Nashu, rest in peace, and the Firestone Firehawk series, um, I was able to craft my road racing skills and building and business uh, racing with people in this room. <laughs> Um, that relationship, um, the Firehawk, Firestone Firehawk series, who Roger Elliott was uh, a major part of, he took me on as a technical director for Super Touring, 
uh, in the United States that raced with uh, the IndyCar, IndyCar Kart Series. Uh, another great opportunity to be involved with some really great people <laughs> that taught me an awful lot. Uh, after that, um, went back to a little bit of road racing with my uh, son. Uh, we ran him nationally in a GT2 series here in Canada, uh, and we won the championship in that series. After that, um, I was lucky enough to be asked to be the technical, <coughs> technical director for the Motor Motorola Cup Series. And it was very short-lived because the Motor Motorola Cup Series ran out of money. I think the second month I worked for him, and I hope that wasn't my fault. Um, but that series was given to the Grand American Road Racing Series in, in uh, Florida, which was owned by NASCAR Jim France family. Uh, so I became, um, I led the Grand American Road Race Technical Series for a number of years. And that accumulated with me running a, running and developing a very rewarding NASCAR engine dyno program. Um, a lot of crossover again with CASCAR being purchased by NASCAR. We, we, we tested a lot of those motors and, and allowed a mix of engines to race, uh, save guys a lot of money. Um, I forgot my notes, so I'm reading my phone. It's not working out too good. I'm very thankful for all the motor, motorsports experiences and lessons that were taught to me. Um, and I encourage you, all of you, to find avenues to introduce our youth to motorsports so we can preserve this inst <coughs> institution. Uh, obviously, thanks to the Motorsports Hall of Fame and Peter for your work, for all your work, your 15 directors. I, I appreciate it very much. And I have a, <clears throat> I have a suggestion for you. Um, my wife of 31 years, <clears throat> Julie, has been instrumental in supporting me and allowing me <clears throat> to do what I do under some pretty strange circumstances sometimes. And she's always supported this, always. So I'm going to ask, recommend, suggest to the Canadian Motorsports Hall of Fame that they create a new category <clears throat> for motorsports wives. And I'd like uh -huh. to nominate my wife. <clears throat> Thank you all for being here. I appreciate it very much. Have a good night. Enjoy motorsports. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Scott, for that demonstration on how to score points with your spouse. <laughs> From time to time, the Hall recognizes those at the beginning of their motorsports career that show promise and rewards them with the Rising Star Award. Previous winners of this award have included Lance Stroll, Caden Lapsovich, Nicholas Latifi, and Raphael Lasau. Once again this year, the Hall will present the Rising Star Award. I'd like to call on Bill Klubine of Klubine Motorsports and Andre Laurent from OTSFF Group to say a few words about this year's Rising Star, Matt Clark. the podium. Hey, Andre. I couldn't bring any cheat notes, guys, because uh, 
have a degenerative eye situation and I can't read it. So um, I was fortunate enough to meet Matt Clark uh, and his dad uh, quite some time ago when he uh, raced for uh, Britain, uh, Laura and David Klubine, and I was impressed. Then we sent him down to the States. What does he do? Wins again. Then we sent him to Coda to see uh, if, what he could do on one level up, and uh, he wins again. So uh, myself and uh, Andre have gotten behind him as mentors and sponsors, and we're going to do our best to take him to the next level. Thank you. Andre? Well said, Bill. For ourselves at OTSFF, a lot of people, we've been a ghost in the scene, really, because we've been in motocross and two-wheel. We stepped into four-wheel as a company uh, a couple of years back when I had an adrenaline rush to go race uh, off-road trucks. But when Bill brought um, the attention on board about Matt and his uh, position, what he's doing as a Canadian, we as a company have supported a lot of Canadians. And, for over 18 years and brought them to some massive success and we hope to see the same thing out of this young man and let's give him an applause for sure. Too late? Our 2022 rising star started off his racing career with a dream. He wanted to race in the Indianapolis 500. After a year of casual karting on weekends with his dad, he soon saw himself racing on the international karting stage. The young man soon moved to Formula 1600, where he won 16 of 18 races to win the 2019 title. He then moved his racing program to the United States, where he was runner-up in the F4 championship. His biggest achievement came in 2022, winning the Road to Indy USF Junior Championship. In 2023, Clark will compete in the ultra-competitive US F2000 Championship, still with that ultimate goal, Indy Cars and the Indianapolis 500. Please welcome the 2022 recipient of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame's Rising Star Award, Mac Clark. Good luck. Right over here? Yeah, let's come on right over here. Center there. You know, people always say there's some pressure associated with presenting last, and um, I'm kind of feeling that right now. Here you go. <laughs> Thank you, Peter. I won't make my speech as lengthy as some of the, some of the more experienced gentlemen in this room, um, but I would like to start off thanking, first of all, the Hall, um, you know, for having me as their Rising Star Award this year. A special thanks goes out to Peter Lockhart. That phone call was very unexpected, um, and I'm honored to uh, be receiving this award tonight. I'd also like to personally thank Bill from Klubine Motorsports and uh, Andre Lorne from OTSFF uh, as they continue to support me on my 2023 campaign in USF 2000. I'd also like to mention a thank you to James Hinchcliffe, um, one of my mentors, as well as the people from Speed Group. Uh, Tony Calderon is in the room tonight as well, uh, and they're both a large part of uh, you know, my campaign and uh, our dream to get to the Indy 500. This year, we'll be competing in USF 2000, and um, you know the ultimate goal is always the championship. We're racing in Toronto. I'm racing at home for the first time in three years, and it's something that's you know really exciting as a young driver. Um, I'd also like to give a thank you to my family for being here tonight and some of the supporters from the earlier years of my career, uh, especially my father. He's my hero, and I know that sounds a little cliche, but I wouldn't be here without him. And um, he's really kind of shaped me into the man that I'm trying to be today. Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight, and um, have a great evening. Congratulations, Mac. You're in good company. Look forward to seeing you in a few days in uh, St. Petersburg when the uh, USF 2000 season opens. Let's. Uh 
let Peter Lockhart, the chair of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame, have some closing remarks to uh, wrap things up this evening. Ladies and gentlemen, this has been a, a fantastic evening. We've heard a lot of stories. We've heard a lot of history. Um, and uh, as, as Scott uh, Spencer mentioned, there are so many cross references between the, we, between the group, all these groups. Uh, I've often said that uh, motorsport globally is a really uh, one big family. It's amazing who knows who, and it doesn't take long to connect the dots, which is fantastic. Um, in my earlier comments of talking about my, our board that was here, I asked the board to stand. I've, I've neglected to mention Nicole LaSalle, Irene Chambers, and Joan Rue, who uh, are not in attendance, but are very valued members of our team. And uh, I hope they're watching on a live stream so that my phone doesn't ring right after this. Um, it's, been a, uh, it's been a fabulous evening. And um, we, uh, we're running pretty much late. <laughs> <laughs> but then again, uh, not to worry. Um, I know Todd has a few closing remarks of, about silent auctions and things. And, uh, I will, uh, again, thank everyone for being here. It's, a, it's been a fabulous evening. I'm really, I congratulate all of the inductees, uh, and uh, it's amazing the uh, support that all of you have from your friends, colleagues, and uh, the room is full of them. So thank you very much, and back to you, Todd. Give them all a big hand. They deserve another round of applause. Congratulations to all the new members of the Canadian Motorsport Hall of Fame. Thank you for your generosity, for giving so much to our sport. Um, let it serve as an inspiration to those just starting their motorsports lives. Um, if we continue with this same level of passion, I think we're in good shape for years to come. Uh, the last couple of housekeeping items. The silent auction item bidding uh, continues but will end 30 minutes after the end of the program. So in about 30 minutes and 30 seconds. That's when the silent auction will close. Uh, so please go ahead, make a beeline from your seats and make those bids. The cash bar remains open until 10.45. We remind you if you are choosing to enjoy a drink, please do so responsibly. All of our inductees, if we can ask you to make one quick more trip back up to the stage for a group photo before we move back outside, that would be great. And again, thank you on behalf of the Canadian Motorsports Hall of Fame for coming tonight. Thank you for watching on the live stream. See you next year. Thank you so much.